Welcome to the number one show and the source of truth for all things medtech. Here, we reveal the secrets and stories behind the investments, science, and commercialization of the medtech industry. Every week, we'll take you on a wild ride with the biggest names in the game, from entrepreneurs and investors who are shaking up the market, to healthcare providers who are revolutionizing the way we think and practice medicine. So hold on tight and get ready for a journey like no other. This is the State of MedTech. Hey everybody, welcome back to the show. And today's guest is a really exciting one for me because, you know, let me let me say this. Uh, I know for a fact that perhaps having this guest on today uh, might endanger my show uh, with sponsors and you know potentially people who, um, you know, might have their own opinions made up of this guest based on what they've seen in mainstream media, which. If you listen to the mainstream media today and believe that what you're seeing is truth, um, I don't know if this is the show for you. And so our guest today is Martin Shkreli. Many of you know him as Pharma Bro. And what I used to think about Martin Shkreli was that this is a guy who was very smart. You know, when he was, uh, I think, 31 or 32, he was CEO of Turing Pharmaceuticals, was a company he founded. Uh, Turing, uh, named after Alan Turing, the great computer scientist, he's father of modern computer scientists, and he came up with the, what's called the Turing test, which is kind of the basis for AI. And Martin, you know, uh, took a, uh, essentially acquired a drug uh, called Daraprim, which was for toxoplasmosis, and hiked it up from $13 to a staggering $750 per pill virtually overnight. And of course, this uh, brought him into the mainstream media. That's when I found out about him. And, and at the time, I thought, wow, what a, what a D-bag. <laughs> like, you know, uh, this guy's got this, you know, sort of uh, sh- smirk on his face and, you know, seems to be a center of controversy. He doesn't really care that he took this drug and made it so unaffordable. Of course, he was mentioned by uh, members of Congress. Hillary Clinton talked about him. Um, you know, the mainstream media was, you know, they, he was brought before Congress to testify about this drug. And, you know, all these uh, co- members of Congress were like, oh, you're such a bad person. And, you know, uh, it, it the flames of his fame, or it may be infamy, uh, kind of like took off from there because he also uh, spent two million bucks on a uh, Wu-Tang Clan album called Once Upon a Time in Shaolin. And then decided to withhold the album from the public and kind of bragged about rarely playing it. And, you know, it was kind of like a, a, a symbol of like his, 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 of his brand, right? And so, of course, as mentioned, like a lot of high profile figures, including politicians like Hillary Clinton, they essentially took aim at him and then made him a target in discussions about corporate greed and regulation. And uh, at least to me, maybe at the time, his confidence. And maybe how he decided to handle things combined with, you know, a series of provocative public statements and contentious business moves kind of ensured that he was going to be this sort of infamous character. And then I changed my mind. The reason why I changed my mind is because I started to listen to some of his um, his uh, interviews. And what struck me was I was like, wow, I was like, you know, there's a big difference between the guy I'm hearing on these interviews versus what I'm hearing from the media and these short little clips that at the time I didn't think much of, but I realize now we're taking kind of out of context. Um, I think Martin is extremely intelligent. Uh, I think he's actually quite thoughtful with how he thinks about things. And even, um, you know, his uh, mission with touring was that his idea was to take a drug like Daraprim, which um, really saw no innovation for decades, right, for toxoplasmosis, which essentially kills you, and raise the price up that much, but only for uh, big payers uh, and corporations like Walmart and, you know, uh, Kaiser, you know, those payers who have their own insurance uh, um, uh, uh, systems. And if it was a patient who did not have insurance, the patient got the drug for free. So nobody 
nobody didn't get the drug, you know? And in terms of the price hike, as I educated myself over the last few years about pharma and, you know, uh, just coincidentally, I started speaking more at pharma events. So I said, hey, I should, should learn more about this industry. I realized that the drug, drug hike, uh, dr the price hike um, with, with Daraprim was actually nothing in comparison to a lot of other pharma companies. And, and this is where I started to say, well, you know, why, why is this guy being painted as sort of the face of pharma and this like greedy villain who's privileged compared to some of these other pharma um, CEOs? Of course, you know, one of those sites that I educated me was a blog that Martin Shkreli published. And again, when he published this on April 1st of 2018, um, you know, I was, uh, I was, I was pretty shocked by it because I was like, man, takes a lot of brass to write this. But essentially he lists, if you go to pharmaskeletons.com or just Google big pharma skeletons in the closet, uh, you'll see a list of companies with, um, uh, with essentially with, with the links listed, right? Um, and essentially kind of a, in a, entertaining way, but also an eye-opening way, sharing how each one of these companies not only hikes prices, but just does all of these things, right? Uh, including not putting a lot of money towards R&D. What I learned is a lot of big pharma actually doesn't shell a lot of money into R&D. And what Martin's idea was, was to raise the price, of course, make a profit because let's face it, we're all in this industry as well. It's very difficult to take these kind of products to market and so if there's no way to make a profit, nobody would do it. But to take a good amount of that and put 30 to 40%, at least from Martin's words uh, from interviews in the past, was to sho shove 40% of it back into R&D. The other side of it that I was also surprised to see was that you know the, fa the man comes from extremely humble beginnings, from the way that the media and Congress kind of painted him. I thought he was this... Uh, privileged trust fund kid who went to an Ivy League school, just essentially the kind of guy that's very easy to dislike. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, the guy is, um, you know, uh, born, uh, first born, uh, for, uh, he's an, he's comes from an immigrant family, Albanian immigrants, came to this country, grew up extremely humble beginnings with his siblings. Uh, his father was a doorman, mother was a janitor for a long period of their life, you know, um, and he found his way at age 16 to go and intern for Jim Cramer when he's a trader. Graduated from a very small, like, just regular, you know, college. And because of his his work ethic, his intelligence, his curiosity, he was able to sort of catapult himself and you know rise in terms of success. You know, like not everybody uh, is able to go on PubMed and spend hours at a time reading these papers to discover, you know, potential innovations in biotech. From, from what I found, it was, it became a thing. He, Martin became so good at this that, you know, at one point, one of his companies, I think it was a hedge fund or something was trying to uh, buy a drug from Pfizer. And Pfizer said, well, if Martin Shkreli is coming to buy our drug, we probably have it underpriced. And they decided not to sell it to him. And then raise the price of the drug up. And then finally, you know, if you go on his YouTube channel, he doesn't strike me as the kind of pharma bro, right, that I that the media made him out to see. Um, you know, a lot of his YouTube videos are about coding, investing, and these are, you know, very long, in-depth uh, videos. There's actually a very good one he's posted recently about whether you should buy or rent, you know, and he has a spreadsheet and kind of walks you through. And so um, all this to say is that this is somebody that I, I was wrong about. And so when I found out um, that uh, he was back on, he was back on social media, um, you know, and unfor you know, unfortunately, you know, be for, for a completely unrelated incident, you know, he did spend time in jail about seven years for securities fraud, which by the way, um, I don't know the details of that. Uh, I'm not a lawyer. But all I can tell you is this is that when you run a hedge fund, um, it's very easy to go to jail because you could essentially be told that, hey, you either underpriced or overpriced this one stock to your 
investors and then like you committed fraud, right? And so it's, you know, I didn't realize, but running a hedge fund is like probably one of the riskiest things you can do. Yes, you make a lot of money, but extremely, extremely risky. And again, the only reason why I'm going through all this detail because I want you to know from my perspective, because the moment you go and let's say Google's name, you're not going to find good information. It's, it's going to be a lot of like glorified media hits. And so again, Martin went to jail, not because of the dramatic price hike uh, with Darren, right? Um, which, you know, really is a thing that thrusts him in the spotlight, but mainly because of securities fraud. August 2017, it was convicted of three of eight counts, two counts of security frauds, uh, one count of conspiracy to commit securities fraud. And these convictions, you know, stem from his time running two hedge funds, SM, SMMB Capital and SMMB Healthcare and Retrofriend, which was a biopharma company. And so prosecutors argued that he essentially lied to invest uh, investors and about the performance of his hedge fund and misappropriated funds from Retrofin to pay off his debts. Essentially, he was found guilty of this, right? And you know, again, using his the assets of the company to pay you know pay off the debts of the other. Um, I'm not saying that's good or bad. All I'm saying is that he did not go to jail because of of, of hiking up the price of drugs. Another thing, again. These are these are all things that um, people I think have gotten wrong. Uh, he's also not the pharma CEO who had anything to do with the insulin drug. We all remember the uh, insulin drug that was in the news that there was a big price hike on it. He has nothing to do with that. He was literally invited onto I think NBC, MSNBC or one of those shows just to talk about it and provide his perspective. And so I mention all of this and I provide this context because many of you probably know about Martin, but I guarantee you, you probably didn't do the due diligence that I did over the over this period of a few years, where you realize that you were actually wrong in the way that you characterized him. And again, I'm not saying that uh, he's an angel, uh, far from it. And by the way, uh, if you don't follow him on Instagram, I highly, highly recommend it because he is, he is a great follow. His YouTube channel is also great. Um, but, you know, he's somebody who has this intellectual curiosity about healthcare and medicine and how do we make the world uh, function in a more, in a, in a better way, right? And again, not defending his past actions, but I just want to provide that context because you probably don't know about it. Um, now, why do I have him on the show? Well, you know, he started a new company called Dr. Gupta. You can check him out at drgupta.ai. That's D. Uh, D-R-G-U-P-T-A dot A-I. It's a virtual doctor chatbot uh, that uses uh, the latest techniques in AI and, and large language models. And essentially, it's made so they can answer any healthcare-related question at any time uh, that you want. So rather than patients going on Google or um, anything, you know, WebMD and getting confused, you know, they can go to this, you know, chatbot, which is essentially similar to ChatGPT, uh, and have a conversation with it, provide labs, etc. And this uh, AI that this LLM they have has been trained on thousands, maybe millions at this point of PubMed research articles. I personally used it um, when my son was sick. And, you know, because I have, you know, a little bit of a medical background, I spent a little time in medical school, I knew what we needed to do, but I was curious how Dr. Gupta would perform. It actually did a fantastic job. So definitely go check it out. And, you know, the last thing I'll say is, you know, before I had Martin on the show, you know, we were talking beforehand and I kind of wanted to gauge him. And usually I ask my guests this question um, and it kind of tells me a lot about them. And I asked him, I say, hey, Martin, um, before, you know, we, we hit play on this podcast, like, let's pretend I'm a magical genie and, and you had... Uh, three wishes that would be granted as a result of this podcast, what, what would those be? And the guy could have said a lot of different things. And, you know, the first thing that he said, and, you know, I've, I've dealt with a lot of people, I've interviewed a lot, so it's pretty easy for me to, to tell if somebody's being honest and genuine. He was being very honest and genuine. You know, the first thing he said was uh, for Dr. Gupta to have, uh, you know, I think he said like 10 million visits, because that's what it would take to hopefully save at least one life as a result of it. And I can tell that he meant it. You know, so um, I had a really great time with him. I think you guys are going to love this episode. And, uh, you know, do me a favor and show some love on this episode. Show some love online. Give Martin a follow. And, uh, you know, hopefully we can get him back on the episode because I think there's a lot of things that we can learn from him. So 
With that being said, here's our episode with Martin Shkreli, founder of drgrupta.ai. Enjoy. Welcome back, everybody, to the State of MedTech. I have a good and very interesting guest on today. Before we get into it, I just want to make sure to remind you, if you're a clinician, be sure that after you listen to this episode at the State of MedTech, we give you guys CME credits. So click the link below and unlock that AMA PRA Category 1 CME credit. So my guest today, he's definitely internet famous, maybe internet infamous, right? But you know, over the years, I've followed him and, re and recently has a new company called DrGupta.ai, a very interesting one. I think one that's going to have a very profound impact on healthcare, and that is Martin Shkreli. Martin, thank you so much for joining the show. How are you doing today? Thanks a lot, Omar. I'm doing great. Awesome. Fantastic. You know, Martin, like, um, I think, um, you know, the average person has some, you know, idea about who you are. In my personal opinion, based on how the media likes to portray people, especially when it comes to an industry like pharma, which is where you, you know, you build your, your, your wealth and your success. Um, it, there's no face of pharma. Like if, you know, it's funny when you think about it, like this is a very, one of the, one of the biggest industries in America. And if you look at uh, American trust, it's like second lowest, like it's the most mistrusted industry, but there's no face of pharma. And I feel like for better, for worse, for a variety of different reasons, um, you put yourself in a position where you became the face of pharma. And in some ways, you know, um, and again, I'm not defending you here, but just became kind of a whipping boy uh, for, for media, for, 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 for politicians. And many years ago, when I learned about you, like many people, I think I, I, I thought I was like, I was like, man, I was like, this guy sounds like a jerk, like, uh, you know, <laughs> what a D bag. But a lot of the things that I looked up, I was like, wow, I was like, a lot of this was wrong. They, they kind of painted you as this sort of uh, privileged trust fund kid. And in fact, um, you are uh, either an immigrant or first generation American, uh, which are the... Uh, my family was just arrived in America and I was born in, in Brooklyn, like the first or second year my, my parents got here. Got it. So, so like me, you're a first generation uh, immigrant. Um, so before we get into Dr. Gupta AI, and again, really interesting ideas around how AI and generative AI is going to change healthcare. Can we sort of set the record straight and hear like, who is Martin Shkreli? Yeah. I mean, I, I was, uh, let's see, born in Brooklyn about 40 years ago and, um, born to, uh, two immigrants, uh, fresh off the boat, if you will, and, uh, refugees from communist, uh, Albania. So, um, you know, my parents, uh, came to America and didn't have any education or any skills or any, anything really. And the whole family just sort of abandoned Eastern Europe for the great beacon of hope that America is. And they had their family. And, uh, you know, uh, I was, uh, just a precocious kid that loved reading, loved books, loved science, um, really loved medicine. Um, my dream was always to become a doctor, uh, you know, try to, you know, be a doctor scientist, maybe cure some disease that everyone was worried about or something like that. And um, going through high school, I, I continued to sort of study that kind of stuff. And then I found myself, crazily enough, on Wall Street uh, when I was 16, working for Jim Cramer, the wild, uh, crazy guy we, on TV. Got, I got, I guess, I got to stop there for a second. So like, one of the things that's very remarkable about your, about your history is that like, you know, at least from what I, what I, what I've read, you, you finished high school early, you finished college early. You made, you made your first million very, very early. You said at 16, you're working for Jim Cramer, the guy who's on TV, you know, the, the stock guy, right? Yeah. Yeah. Jim had a hedge fund. Um, so much of, uh, I've seen some of your guests and so forth. So much of, of the medical innovation is inextricably kind of tied to the financial world, whether it's VC or even more and more hedge funds and private equity and stuff like that. And uh, I got a chance to work for Jim. Um, you know, you don't know much when you're 16, and I certainly was no exception. But you know, Jim was a really nice guy who I think kind of paid it forward. Um, you know, by having me around. Uh, you know, at the time, I remember the the big stocks that I was looking at were like Human Genome Sciences, which didn't have a business plan really. <laughs> they they started yeah, to it's just like cost a lot of money, but like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember asking what, what was next after the human genome and the, the company's phrase was the mouse genome was next. And this is sort of like a, you know, kind of a, it was a very valuable company for what it was. It was uh Solera genomics as well, which was like, Oh a, yeah. Kind of like the, yeah. If you remember those guys and I haven't Solera heard that actually in a long time. Solera, what's funny about Solera is that they licensed, they tried to sort of pivot to, to drug discovery and they licensed Ibrutinib, which was the, the BTK inhibitor, uh, 
So they ended up kind of like striking it sort of rich. Um, you know, if that drug ended up in Pharmacyclic's hands when Solera decided they didn't want to be a drug company anymore. Mm. Um, so anyway, it was kind of interesting. I started to follow pharma. Jim, Jim liked mostly at the time, like everyone else, tech was kind of all the rage, the, the dot-com bubble, all that stuff was interesting. So I got to learn a lot about bubbles. Um, Around and what year was that, this that you were working for him? 2000. 2000. Yeah, two, okay. 2000. So, Can I ask how, how old you are? I think you're around the same age as I am, actually. I'm 40 now, yeah. You're 40. Oh, okay, okay. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah, Jim Jim taught me a lot about work ethic. You know, Jim, um, you know, was a great trader. He's, he's maybe less so of a great investor, but he was a really fabulous stock trader. Um, so that's what, kind of why his, like, TV picks are sometimes off is that, you know, he's he's really kind he, of – He gets a lot know, of – I feel like he had the same effect that Drake has when Drake bets on teams. Like, Jim Cramer has the same thing. You know, I'm just waiting for the stars to align and for Drake and Jim Cramer to bet on something, <laughs> you know, like, you know, it's hard. So. It's hard to be Jim, you know, getting asked, but he's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And uh, he loved, I think people, ahead, people, man. I'm sure he makes a lot of great picks, but you know, a lot of people want to like sensationalize like massive, like, you know, mistakes that he made, like, or things that he, he was wrong. What was something, you know, it sounded like he was a mentor to you. What was something that, that you learned from him? Yeah. I wouldn't say like a mentor because, you know, at the time it was like the end of his career. He retired later that year. And he did the TV thing since then. I'd say like the work ethic was was incredible. I think that you know he taught me th what real hard work meant, and that like the forty hour work week that you kind of grow up as a kid thinking, okay, well you punch your clock and then you're out. You know, then I see a real business owner, somebody who owns his own business, a small business, uh, and is up at four a.m. You know, it has the passion that sometimes you know spilled over into aggression. Um, mm. you know, in, in sort of a, becoming a madhouse that a hedge fund often is of screaming and yelling and, and pointing fingers and emotional, um, really tough emotional business. Um, but he showed me that, you know, you could, you know, take this thing that most people consider boring and, and a drudgery of work and make it something that was exciting and something you could fight for and live for and put all your passion into. And, and as I, tried to start pharmaceutical companies over the years, I kind of kept that in mind. And, and it, it, it sort of spilled over into me where, where I could really pour my heart and soul into, into a company or business or project. And I think any entrepreneur will tell you that, you know, that's absolutely required, whether it's a med tech company or a pharma company or any kind of company, you have to give it all you've got or you're not going to make it. And I think that Jim, from a really early age, that, that kind of hit me in the face. And Jim, Jim mostly was focusing on tech, but like he liked healthcare, he liked trading any kind of stock, really. But, you know, every now and then he'd trade pharma. When he was uh, at Harvard, he used to trade pharma. And this was sort of pharma's golden age in the 90s uh, when uh, or late 80s, uh, early 90s, when when pharma was just sort of uh, starting to pick up on drugs like statins and so forth. Pharma's uh, yeah. companies like Merck were pretty small back then in the 80s. And, and, and they sort of grew to be juggernauts in the 90s. I don't think I don't think Stark Law or Sunshine Law Act existed back then. So the eighties and nineties, like, <laughs> yeah, Med Device and Pharma was just like insane. Some of the stories I hear are just wild. I mean, you, you could know? get a, a device approved with any amount of data. <laughs> I, yeah, I know. <laughs> seriously, seriously, like, 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 there's, you know, sometimes I go to the Med Device conferences and there's these. Um, small little companies that just sell like all these random tools. I'm like, how are these companies still around? They just sell these random tools. So it's just like, they just got things approved and like, you know, <laughs> they're just stuck around. There's actually a book I'm reading called the uh, surgeon salesman where back in the seventies, this guy like blew the roof off on the med device industry and pretty much said like, yeah, like for me to get my device to be used in a case, like the surgeon actually wants me to scrub and do that part of the case. So I was doing that, you know, this is a wild, it's it was crazy. a wild world. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we followed, I, after, after stints with Kramer, I worked at a tiger cub hedge fund and then I started my own hedge fund and we actually studied med tech stocks as well. And, um, How you know, so we followed, started that, uh, started that fund. I was 24. Uh, it didn't go great. Um, I started a second hedge fund that didn't go that great either. Um, you know, I, I became, I realized that, you know, I might be a better long-term investor, whether that be private equity or, um, kind of, uh, uh, entrepreneurial VC type roles, which are really, really long-term. And so trading, uh, is just sort of a strange business. <laughs> um, and I don't recommend it to anybody unless you really love stock trading. It's very difficult. It's, it's insane. I feel like, you know, you ha it's almost like drugs. Like you have to be like legitimately obsessed with, like, I've met a few traders and these are the only people that I would see who, I don't know, on a Friday night would be wondering like, 
man, what's what's this company CEO doing tomorrow <laughs> for brunch? Like, what what are they? How are they spending their time and everything? It's just like I, I guess if you don't care enough to know what the markets are going to do on the Monday on a Monday, it's just like not a good thing to go into, right? Yeah, I think I think I totally agree in that you you have to have it in your blood. Like, you really have to care about every tick of the stock. And I did better when. I could take a multi-year view and kind of just be patient with my investing. And I ended up, you know, one of the things about the hedge fund business that's really tough to do is you have this like compulsion to trade. So once I quit hedge funds, I ended up becoming a fairly decent trader and a really good investor myself because I didn't have other people's money kind of, mm. you know, uh, holding, you know, it's, it's sort of a different responsibility um, when it's your own and you almost get like, you get a lot of these other fears that creep in when you're managing other people's money. But, you know, it's, it's not easy to manage money for a living in general. I mean, I think that, you know, it's, it's not a, you know, the earlier stage stuff, I could see that, you know, how that helps society, but in terms of the later stage stuff and then trading, you know, you're not really doing much, but playing a video game. Like you're sort of like, yeah. you know, yeah. shuffling money around and you know, the world's not going to change because you think Medtronic's worth 60 and it's going to go to 65 and you're, or something like that. Like that's not really, you know, productive use of anyone's time, but you know, there is some, you know, tertiary benefits to it. But anyway, uh, you know, I followed MedTech. I, I followed companies like Align and Medtronic, Covidian, and, uh, you know, St. Jude when they were still around and Boston Scientific and all those companies. And, you know, it was a pleasure, you know, it was, uh, it's just a joy to, to look at all these companies trying to do different things. You know, pharma was, um, to me, always my kind of calling, but, you mm -hmm. know, I, I thought about acquiring MedTech companies or, or building a MedTech company. I'm not banned from MedTech, for example, so <laughs> I could, could conceivably what? do MedTech. Really, really random question, but like, if you had to pick one, like, what's, what's your favorite MedTech company and why? So, so we bought this stock in 2000 and we, my, my old partner and I were looking back at like our old records and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. We bought this old stock, Align, uh, way back when, and it, it ended up becoming this like 20 or 30 X, uh, from where we bought it. And it was just such a surprising, you know, thing to, to think that like, you know, um, you know, this, this, this invisible brace, uh, could be such a huge success and, mm -hmm. you know, them, and then maybe a close second would be. Uh, some of the CGM companies um, like Dexcom, you know, like just at a time when like we were all looking at this as like, you know, who really needs this product, you know, and, and if you look at the, like the seven points of, of insulin, um, there wasn't really a great rationale that you needed to be exactly in range at all the time and stuff like that. So it was like it was a little bit of a hard sell. And it ended up becoming, you know, this, this thing where, you know, they have Super Bowl commercials and stuff like that. It was like it's too amazing. It's pretty wild. It's like yeah. really incredible uh, stories. And then, you know, we were also short sellers. So we would sometimes find these like real, real dogs of, of companies. MedTech is no shortage of kind of fraud and, you know, kind of crappy companies that pharma has. And, and sometimes it's, you know, some of these are, are really kind of hokey companies that sort of want to make stem cells out of some distillate of some like bodily fluid and then re-inject you with the stem cells. <laughs> and like, you know, it's just like Gee. things that are really out of control. So it's a lot of fun. Like hedge funds can be fun, you know, where you're, you're like looking at all these companies and kind of like, you know, kicking them around. But, you know, my, my calling was, was the real innovative stuff and innovation in med tech is, is like really tricky. Like we, I met, I have a friend and if, you know, I, I shouldn't mention names, but like there are a lot of interesting innovations where, you know, it seems like in med tech, you can kind of be like a mad scientist. <laughs> and so yeah, yeah, up. totally. Like sometimes come up with something cool, whereas pharma has this like very staid, like there is no mad scientist in pharma. You're just doing like your high, th high throughput screen or your ProTac or you're like very established like modality. And you're you're like a, a avant-garde if you're like trying cell therapy or something wacky like that. But like in med tech, it's, it's kind of like anything goes and you never know when a screw, a simple like design change in a screw could be worth a billion dollars. And yeah, you know, it's exactly. A, it's kind of an interesting you, industry. Did you ever look into uh, like, because you're, you know, the early 2000s, like you were, you were trading and looking at these things, but what did you ever look at into it as surgical? Sure. Of course. You know, uh, I had a friend at a fellow Tiger Cub uh, who was uh, their largest shareholder or something like that. And the funny thing about Intuitive is they came public through a reverse merger, basically, which is like... And, and I my, never knew my that. Company, yeah. My I know a lot about open. Intuitive, but I didn't know about that. The very, very early days in 2000, like uh, four, 2005. And, you know... Um, my friend just hit, hit that like a hundred X return out of that or something. And I, uh, when I went public, uh, myself as Retrofin, uh, the biotech company now called Trevere, uh, which recently won its first FDA approval. I, uh, I went through a reverse merger as well. We then did a uplisting to NASDAQ, but you know, as did intuitive, but it was like, it's a very like hokey kind of like the SEC is basically all but closed off the possibility now, but 
it's like a it's like a mini kind of IPO. It's like a very like you know it's usually not a good sign when your company goes public through reverse merger. But success stories like in, Intuitive or Retrofin, Trevier, uh, and others like you know give give hope that you know you can kind of go from zero to hero with with that world. Mm-hmm. So quick, you know, quick question, something, and again, if you don't want to talk about it, that's perfectly fine, but you, you kind of skipped over something that I, I want to ask you about. So, you know, uh, clearly very talented, uh, early, early in, in, in your youth, uh, started working for Jim Cramer Kramer at age 16, opened your first hedge fund, you said at age 24, is that correct? So, yep. you know, you, you come from like extremely humble beginnings, you know, can you talk a little bit about like, um, you know, when your parents immigrated here from Albania, which by the way, for people who are not uh, knowledgeable. Albania, correct me if I'm wrong, it's, it's like one of the poorest countries in Europe. Um, it is the poorest country in Europe, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, but when they but, came here to the United States, what did your parents do do for work? And what was your, what, what was it like for you being a first-generation American with immigrant parents growing up in Brooklyn? Yeah, my parents worked really hard. Um, my, my dad worked as a doorman. My mom worked as a porter. And... Um, my dad ended up sort of um, becoming a manager and things like that. So he started to get, you know, successful, uh, relatively speaking. I'm still talking very middle class, but he started to, to do better, um, you know, from odds and ends to sort of like, um, you know, in, in sort of middle management uh, or, or lower middle management uh, of, of a big industrial sort of sanitation company. So, you know, it was, it was uh, I think when you, when you grow up poor, you don't realize you're growing up poor unless, <laughs> unless you really have like a mirror to hold up against, you know, cause you're hanging out with the kids in your neighborhood and they're in a similar economic situation than you are. I mean, you don't know that kids are on park Avenue have boarding school and they're going to the summer camp and stuff like that. You might see it in the movie, but you figure that's like make believe. Uh, so when I went to high school in Manhattan at, at, uh, what I think is like the, one of the best high schools in America, Hunter high school, um, you know, I got a little bit of some, some self-awareness, but even then I didn't really fully, fully get it. Um, you know, until after kind of, you know, uh, it took a while for me to realize that. So I was, I was sort of lucky in a sense that I, I was sort of immunized from some of that and that, you know, I, I had what I, what I wanted in a lot of ways, you know, um, I didn't sort of, you know, think too hard about the kids who had, you know, houses in the Hamptons or something like that. I, I was so focused on computers at the time. That was sort of my main love was computer programming, um, you know, as a teenager. And then, Eventually, when I got into to hedge funds, I, I sort of forgot all about computer programming. Uh, but I, I just kind of loved science and tech. And, and you know, when you're a nerd, uh, so to speak, uh, I use that term endearingly, you know, you don't uh, think about money as much. You know, I think that, you know, you, well, you can sort of be aloof about it. I was going to say, I mean, you, it seems like you, you're still the same way because, you know, at one point, I mean, you were making – you made millions and millions of dollars with the exception, which we'll, we'll talk about the story later of you, you know, purchasing the Wu-Tang album for like, I think two or $3 million. Um, you know, you, at least I didn't see anything. Um, you're not going out like parting your face off in New York and everything. For the most part, you were at home. Like you make like YouTube videos on trading and on coding and different things. You did that back then. You still do that now. So, I mean, you definitely hold true to that. Um, and during this time, was your mother just like, uh, like, do you have siblings? Your mother like was just like a was was a caretaker. Like, w- w- did your mother have to work as well? Yeah, my mom worked twenty four seven. She was just a workaholic. Uh, and uh, my sister, uh, my younger sister, and my brother. You know, the four of us were. You know, I mean, we. You know, we kind of like like I said, if you don't know what you're missing out on, you kind of don't miss it, and you don't get you know jealousy or, or envy of the other kids because you have your own little world. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think spent like a lot more time in Manhattan or a lot more time with, with other kids, uh, than maybe I would have thought differently. But even then, like I, I, I was sort of used to like, I remember going to, um, like a girlfriend's house of, of like a wealthy family. And I ended up like sitting down at the table and talking stocks with their, with their dad more than I would hang out with them. And so like, you know, I, I was not expecting that. Right. 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 And it was just sort of like one of these nice things where, you know, um, you know, I, I, I'm still, some people call me aloof sometimes now. Um, there's sort of that uh, trope of like the high functioning autistic aloof. And I, I'm not somebody who has autism, but like, there's this trope of like, 
the person that doesn't always get every social cue, which I've been accused of in the past. But I think that you can mistake that sometimes for just an in intensity where like if you love something like the stock market, like you don't think about, oh, gee, well, you know, I'm from the other side of the tracks and I'm taking a Metro card to, to get here. And, you know, I'm wearing clothes that, you know, from Old Navy or something. And I'm here, I'm talking to this multimillion dollar, you know, uh, you know, uh, captain of industry that I happened to met his, you know, daughter in, in, in high school. And did, you don't, you know, you kind of just don't think about it. And you, you want to talk about your parents. Stock. Yeah. Did your parents know, like, for example, that you went to like somebody's home like that? And, you know, what was, what was their reaction? What, what did you your know, mother, I'm sorry. What did your, you mentioned your mother worked 24 seven. What did your mother do? She was a porter janitor type, type of role. So she would clean and many Albanian immigrants did that. In fact, the, the office we have on 42nd street, um, all the, the, the porters are Albanian and so they, they say hi and they, you know, I uh, just met one the other day who said she's my fifth cousin removed or something. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, I, um, you know, it's a very common job for, for Albanians over the last, uh, you know, a couple of decades, uh, coming to America and Albanians have subsequently kind of done better and are now restaurant owners and business owners, uh, mm. in, in America and, uh, especially in New York, uh, which is where and, most of them settle to. Yeah. And I want to get, you know, next to, um, you know, a little bit about, about Turing and, 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 you know, the story behind Daraprim and then, you know, jump right into Dr. Gupta, but something I, I want to point out, and I, I'm not sure if like, um, I don't, I'm, I don't know if you do this, uh, unknowingly, but like you, you have this remarkable story, Martin. Um, and again, like you've made, you've made some mistakes. I'm not here to defend any of those things, but you know, at least from where I sit, you know, somebody who came from a very, very poor comp country to this country, right? Landed in New York. Uh, your father was a doorman. Your mother was a janitor, right? With sibling and you had these siblings. And then somehow you found a way to express your talents and your work ethic. You worked for Jim Cramer at age 16. You know, where, uh, where did you end up going to college? Did you, did you ever go to college or? Yeah, I went to college at night and on weekends and in the summer, like any time I wasn't working at the hedge fund. Where did fund, you graduate from? Uh, I went to Baruch College in New York. Okay. City University of New York. Got it. But, you know, essentially pretty humble be beginnings. And then you found your way to Wall Street, making millions. You, you started a pharmaceutical company and everything. You made some, you know, maybe some mistakes along the way, of course. And, you know, and, and again, I'm not here to defend those things, but from my perspective, I mean, you have a, you have this wonderful story that like, it, in my opinion, is the American dream. And I think that's like very commendable. And I'm like, I'm shocked that like not enough people know about this. And the fact that like, I had to string this together. So I'm going to give you some like, uh, like, like as a friend, like some advice, you should like package that like explanation about your background, because it, it's, a, it's a remarkable story. And I think a lot of people would be inspired by that, especially like, I mean, I'm first generation American. My, my wife is an immigrant from Turkey and like, she loves those kind of things. Like I, when I told her about your background, that's why she was like, Oh, like when he comes on, let me come in and just say hi to him. You know, it's been a wild ride. I mean, um, I don't think I've, you know, suffered for, for boredom. I mean, it's, uh, not many people can say they've, they've built billion dollar company. They've gone to Congress. They've been hauled in front of Congress. They went to prison. <laughs> they, they sort of came out of prison intact, you know, and, and still, you know, uh, ha having their head held up high. A uh, lot of things, you know, uh, in my life that, you know, um, again, I, I'm not the kind of person that says I'd go back, I'd do something differently, but I do think it's been, it's been a hell of a ride and I hope it's just getting started. You know, I think that there's still a lot of life to live and, and a lot of interesting oh, things. Oh, totally, to, man. Bro, you're, you know? you're, 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 you're very, very young. You're very young. So unless there, unless there's some, some, something worth mentioning, like, can we fast forward to like kind of touring? Uh, so, I think, you so know, you had, you had a couple, I, you had a couple of failures with, with hedge funds, you know, so one at 24, yeah, one later on. Yeah, 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 please, please continue. Yeah, relative failures. I think my first hedge fund was was basically a total total failure. But my, my second hedge fund wasn't a total failure, despite, yeah. I think, you know, some... What did you some, learn from uh, the first hedge fund? What, what did you learn that was painful that made you change for the better? I, I, I think that, you know, I think that the main thing I learned is that being smart doesn't entitle you to anything. <laughs> you know, mm. like, you can be really smart, but it doesn't mean that you're going to automatically kind of get something out of life, whether it's a successful business or, or whatever. And that, you know, the humility of, you know, you know, just, you know, I, I, I've been in, uh, interviewing interns and all of them are like 1590 on the SATs, you know, you know, Olympiad of, of math or the gold medal Olympiad for computing. And it's and like, they want to get a, a bunch, a big salary as a result of that. Right. Well, you know, they're, they're super <laughs> smart and they're just spending the summer right. Uh, with us. And, you know, 
Um, I love these guys, but ultimately like starting a business and being successful at it are, are is, is something that intelligence is maybe, you know, it's like almost like a covariate or like an R squared. It's like pretty low, you know, um, which is like, you, you're sort of grew up thinking that, you know, it would be like an R squared of 0. 0.9 when it's really an R squared of like 0. 0.2 or 0. 0.3. And that, you know, you have to have a lot of other elements. And I think that you know, specific and specific businesses require different amounts of luck, different amounts of experience, different amounts of everything. So it was very humbling and almost maybe even humiliating uh, and frustrating. But, you know, it also gives you the perspective that, look, you don't have to be good at everything. If you're not great at hedge funds, try being an entrepreneur. If you're not great at that. Try going doing investment banking. I mean, it doesn't mean that, you know, you you have to be one thing or the other, you know. So if you fail at one thing, the, mm -hmm. the humiliation sucks, but you get over it and try something else. And I think, you know, what's great about like being alive this time, you know, especially what, like what a time to be alive is that, I don't know, like, I think this uh, route, unless you want to be just, even just the route of being like, let's say I want to be a doctor or a lawyer or engineer, like the, the world is, is changing. It's so fluid that a lot of it is kind of like molding your life as you go. Like for me, 12 years ago, I was a medical student, right? right. Then, you know, I was in sales, then I was in marketing. Right now, I started my own company, so like, I feel like it—that's kind of like what the life is about. It's kind of like molding it to fit where you are in life, and kind of like really expressing like you know your your main skill sets and talents versus kind of like oh, I should do X, Y, or Z. You know, I just think I just it's it's just such a different world now. There's this insecurity that comes when you when you feel like you're you know entitled or you think that you know you're you're supposed to you know win at something, and then when you don't there's one of two things you could do, which is you could do the right thing, which is you admit it and try to like fix it or correct it or, or do something different. And then the other thing is you sort of lie about it. And I think that that happens a lot. It's happened a lot in, in med tech with say Theranos, um, but also to a smaller extent myself where it can be really embarrassing uh, and hard to confront the self uh, of when you, when you have a setback or failure and you've seen things uh, I think even sequinome was, was an old situation where there was some, some fraud. If you remember sequinome, um, you know, it's, it's hard sometimes to, to really come to grips with the failure. Of course, when you're dealing with, with people's, you know, hedge funds are one thing, but, you know, medical devices and pharma are another where, you know, you really are dealing with people's lives, uh, potentially at stake. Um, and, and I, I can, I sort of understand, you know, the, you know, the same thing that some of these people have gone through where, you know, you have this like huge, you've built up often in some cases erroneously, this huge impression of yourself and then the data starts coming in where it's not working or something like that. And you're like, oh, gee, you know, I have to confront this. Over time, I've learned to, to confront that, that, you know, you have to be secure in, in, in who you are. But, you know, if you've built up this image of yourself where you're infallible, you know, that that can be really, really harmful. And if you look at somebody like Elizabeth Holmes, like she probably easily could have said to her investors, look, you know, it's not working like we thought. I'm going to need another two years to go back to the drawing board and really fix this up. And and that probably alone would have, would have kept her from prison or kept her from you know, um, you know, the, the fate that she's, she's sort of gotten and, and, um, uh, to a much, 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 much smaller extent. And again, I still protect my innocence. You know, the same thing sort of happened to me where it was really hard to sort of confront difficulties in, in business, uh, with, with, with in a hundred percent honest view. It, so yeah, the Elizabeth home Theranos thing is really interesting because it is a medical device company, but like, because of how much press it got, I think people never looked at it as a device company, they looked at it as a tech company. Like, I, the, I feel like like the people in medical device are like, oh man, it, it, it really tarnished our industry. I'm like, nobody even thinks of our industry. Like, but if you were to talk to Elizabeth <laughs> Holmes today, like, let's True. just say like, she, you know, I were to sit you down with her and I'd be like, hey, Elizabeth Holmes, Martin Shkreli, Martin, like what piece of advice would you give her? So I feel like her, her persona, uh, love it or hate it. I feel like that, like she needs to be studied. Like, you know, there's something there, but what, what kind of advice would you give her? I don't know if I'd have good advice for her because I think like... I think there are people that, you know, make an honest mistake. And then there are people that, you know, again, I don't know her. So what can I say? But there are people that sort of, I mean, to, to some extent, like if she wants to start a new page and like when she gets out and just, just have like a regular old job and, and, and do fine, I think she, she can do that. I think that, you know, it's hard to sort of look at, at what she's done and, and take away anything other than, than like she kind of fabricated a whole lot. You know, I think that in my case, like I, I have real talents that are like, you know, kind of not, you know, um, you can't sort of take them away from me. Elizabeth has talents that are like not 
useful. Like she's very good. At, <laughs> she's very good at raising yeah. money. Like she was very yeah. good at tricking people into parting with their money. Like those aren't like so. I'm sure she's a she's got some redeemable qualities. I just feel like you know it's it's a and 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 to a certain extent, she might have been manipulated by her older partner or things like that. But I think that like people like that need a lot of time with a therapist. Not to segue, but like we're we're working on an AI therapist and part of learning um part of making this ai therapist um, i'm sort of the primary prototype developer for our company then i kind of kick it over to the real programmers who who make it you know more in a more sophisticated way but as i'm prototyping this thing i realized that like i actually have to spend a lot of time reading about psychotherapy and reading about reading these books to sort of see how it's done and it's a complicated field and that and, was you know a lot of was that a main was that the main reason to kind of uh for for the inception of dr gupta was that was for for mental health no it wasn't really um i'll tell you that story in a second but you know the reason i bring it up is i think pe there are p plenty of people out there who who and I, I you know i'm one of them i think i think every one of us needs sort of you know the most the best mental health we can get oh all I of us I, you know why martin by the way I, I think everybody needs some level you know level of mental health and therapy and everything Never at this point of history has our brains been exposed to this much incoming information. You know, technically we're we're indirectly kind of plugging our minds into AI. Like our your your brain is not used to that. I mean, I'll, very this is a very subtle example, but like you know, I study psychology, I meditate, everything. You know, the other day I I so I use Instagram for business, but I'm going to get exposed to things on there. You know, and I got exposure to a couple of people who I know who I follow who are doing really really well. Right. And one of them, there's specific, some specific things I saw and made me feel really bad. Right. Cause I was like, sure? I was like, you know, I should be, you know, doing a little bit better in, in these areas. Right. And that, you know, for me, I very quickly, you know, talked to myself. I'm like, you know what, but I'm, I'm on a different path. There are other, there are other things that I, I might have that this person might say, man, I wish I had that. So I was able to talk to my, I'm like, and I forgot about it and I was fine. But the average person, when you get exposure to these kind of things, right? Thousands of times, like you're not used to processing them. I mean, your brain's used to going from one room to another and processing that transition. We're seeing thousands of rooms online, like hypothetical rooms, and, and you don't know how to process that. And I think these things have subconscious implications on them. So I think that's why there's this huge mental health crisis, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree. I mean, I, I look back and, and, and say to myself that if I could give myself advice, I'd give the same advice to Elizabeth Holmes as well, which is be comfortable with who you are, be comfortable with the fact that you're not Superman or Superwoman, that, you know, if you have a setback, you have a setback, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, people will, will, you know, honesty is extremely important. You know, it's, it's, it determines whether or not you get a second chance. And I think that it's unfortunate. So part, part of that is like, you know, it, you get a young person, they get driven too hard, you know, they, they um, start to lie about it and, and lie about the things they can do because they try to keep up with that image of themselves. And I think therapy could actually, bridge a lot of these gaps. And, you know, mm -hmm. when you're a teenager, some you get, you can get some really maladaptive behavior going and without the right parents, you know, we have so many like tiger moms or helicopter moms or whatever, or yeah. parents that shouldn't blame just moms, dads too, um, that sort of want their kids to win so bad that that, that was a little bit of the case with me where, where it ended up being harmful, where it's like, well, you can't, you can't not win. You know? <laughs> and that's, that's a really devastating thing to put in somebody's head that, you know, mm -hmm. failure is not an option, you know, and you hear how, how many times you hear that failure is not an option. Right. And, you know, you, you might fail and, th and that's okay. You know, um, it, you should give your best, but you know, if you fail, it's not the end of your life. And I think that Ooh. that pressure oh. kind of makes the Elizabeth Holmes happen. Yeah. No, no, I, 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 I completely agree. I, I completely agree with that. And I think that, you know, it's just like a plane taking off, like, you know, you hit turbulence. That doesn't mean like you stop and go back and start again, right? It's just data point. You know, I mean, it's kind of a radical example. I, I never like using like over radicalized examples from tech, but it's a good one. But I mean, how, how many times did Elon fail? I mean, look at like with Tesla and SpaceX, like how many like hit pieces were put out there? Like, you yeah. know. Yeah, he, um, he was close to the brink sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, but one thing know, I, let me, I just, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, but one of the things I'm, I'm really proud of is is the company Retrofin, which is now called Trevere. And so many of the, the guys who had worked with me at that company and the and Turing that have spun off and started. Did that spun out, out of that spun out of Turing? A bunch of people either work, working at Retrofin or working at Turing have gone on to start and oftentimes sell or whatever, build really successful drug companies. And I'm so proud of them. And, and real quick, 
can you, can you give like a quick high level on on what Turing is and specifically why do you call it Turing? Sure. So, but I, I guess the point I'm really trying to make here is that Retrofin, our first drug company, uh, it was 28 or something when we started it. We got NASDAQ. Mm -hmm. It's a over a billion dollar valuation still today. Uh, we bought every single drug. Uh, the company acquired was was sort of my idea that that I acquired with my team. And you know, it's it's a company that went through at least a dozen different drug programs. And some of them, you know, got FDA approval. Some of them, of course, didn't work. Some of them were divested to my second company called Turing. Uh, but like, I do want to just point out that a lot of people know me as the price increase guy, but a lot of people don't know me as like, there's a plaque. I don't know if you could see it here somewhere uh, behind me, which is our first US patent that we got issued for our medicinal chemistry work in panathenate derivatives. Um, we've invented brand new drugs, put them in the clinic. Uh, we took a lot of drugs that were abandoned by pharma, put them back in the clinic. Um, we acquired drugs and expanded their their sort of, you know, um, access and different geographical reach. You know, we also expanded their prices very often, which I know a lot of people don't like. Uh, but in fact, you know, when we, our first medicine that we acquired was kinodeoxycholic acid, which is a bile acid. And we um, raised the price of that by 5x overnight. And um, there are 50 people that have that disease. It's called cerebrotendinous xanthomatosis. It's off label. Uh, there are 50 people that have that illness in America and they all take keno, keno deoxycholic acid. And it was a hundred thousand dollar drug. And it was, it was like really not kind of tenable at that price. Um, it was, uh, it was sort of a single manufacturer. There was no ability to sort of teach people what CTX is. Um, and, and it's really funny because it was a really good case where price increase did a lot of good and it sounds so weird but the funny thing is between 100k and 500k that's not a difference to an insurer that's just the same price <laughs> you know there's not like a price sensitivity where like oh well you know 500 that's that's too much but 100 is is just the right ticket they don't well they i don't guess care. what's on on the other side of it it's like you know because people get shocked when they hear like you know uh if you spend a hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, a million dollars on drugs, but the other side of it is like, well, what are the what are the healthcare costs if you're not on the drug, right? That's, well, that's the thing that people so, so that's people the really think about. the really crazy thing about this disease is that this disease is I'm I'm so proud of this price increase, and I know that again it sounds so weird, but you have to think through this logic. This illness is an illness uh, where it's a cholesterol metabolism illness, and if you're you're missing this enzyme, you cannot break down. Uh, this uh, cholesterol metabolite that builds up and you get this xanthomatosis. That's why it's called CTX. And these xanthomas will, will accumulate in your body and they'll accumulate in your eye and you will start to go, you'll start to think you might have glaucoma, right? And the problem is they're also accumulating in your brain and they cause progressive irreversible brain damage. So the problem is doctors don't know what's going on with this disease. They'll see the eye, they'll see, okay, maybe it's, it's, it's juvenile glaucoma, but the problem is that the patient's eight years old, if that patient doesn't get treated, by the time that patient's 11 or 15, they may, have, they may be mentally retarded for the rest of their life. So you need to get that patient early. And as we know in rare diseases, it's very hard to always determine what, what disease the patient has, especially if they're sort of subclinical or just mild symptoms. So we were able to, to field a sales force. Of course, we're, we're trying to increase prescriptions, but we were able to field a medical science sales force, a uh, medical science team, a sales force, education. And I took one family out um, to WWE and they said, Martin, you know, I really like what you're doing here because CTX is an unknown entity. Nobody knows what this disease is. Not even people who are metabolic geneticists <laughs> know what CTX is because mm -hmm. there's 50 of us. Who cares, right? And the yeah, doctor- it's, 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 it's like, like, I can't even believe a drug would exist for, for just 50 people. I've never, but can you, can you, cover something. Okay, you said you're proud of the price increase. You use 5X. Yeah. Why, why are you proud of the price increase? Like, what do you do? Okay. So you're going to end up with more money. What do you do with that money? Yeah. I mean, I think that we were able to get people on this drug by spending the money that we, the five times more revenue that we'd get, which isn't five times more profit, by the way, uh, the five times more revenue, we were able to spend money on people. I know the guy's exact name. I won't use the name, but he was a fellow from Alexion, which was the kind of rare, rare disease leaders. We hired a bunch of people from there, from Genzyme. And these people taught lots of doctors around the country, what the heck is CTX? Why she should look out for it. And every single person whose life we saved, whose mental cognition we saved, teenagers. You know, I, I say that was money well worth it. That's UNH's and Aetna's money. And that's 
across the board, it's Microsoft's money and it's Apple's money. And it's, it's uh, Walmart's money and Costco's money and JP Morgan's money. That's all the, all of us that contribute to healthcare, but it's somebody's kid that normally would not necessarily get their disease identified, get the treatment they needed. And would you rather have a hundred thousand dollar drug and have your child have permanent mental retardation or a $500,000 drug and your life saved and the money doesn't make a difference here. Your copay is zero, no matter what, right? The, the insurance right. does not think about this and say, you know, 500, hmm, let's hem and haul. Let's not save this kid's life. They pay it's right away. The the way, yeah, the same way they, they pay for the Zolgensma or the same way they pay for, you know, any other life-saving medicine. They don't, they don't stop and think about it. They, they, they're worried about GLPs. <laughs> they're worried about, yeah. you know, people using that instead of metformin or insulin instead of metformin. You know, those are the decisions they – they make and they're, 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 they're smart savers because if they weren't, you know, their clients, the big companies I mentioned would go somewhere else. And I think that as we, I'm glad that we have a rare disease business and the, the key problem fast forwarding to Turing a little bit and Daraprim is that people didn't realize, and I still see it today, didn't realize that Daraprim treats an extremely rare disease. It's not 50 people, but it's around 2000, which still, That's people still talk about very, rare disease. very small. Yeah. It's very, very, yeah, it's very small. Very, very few people. And, uh, and again, ever like, get that you know, I want to just touch on this and then I do, I want to get to, uh, to Dr. Gupta, but, um, again, my, you know, I'm not here to defend you, but when I did my research, I was like, that makes sense. Right. Which is, you know, again, pharma never had a face. You became that face, right? You, you became the whipping boy for it. And yes, you did take the price of Daraprint from, I think $13 to $760. But the thing that's left out of context is that the only time that that amount was paid is with an insurer like Walmart or Aetna or anything else. There's not a single patient who was off, you know, insurance who couldn't get access to the drug. Right. And at least like, and again, I'm just, I'm, I'm sharing what my research was based on what I was seeing back then. And what I found found, which is, you know, there are headlines and news like, Oh, imagine waking up and your $13 drunk now costs $760. So I just felt like that was extremely misleading. And it really pisses me off because that that's just not how it works. And it's just very easy to see a headline that like that and jump to conclusions and vilify somebody. Again, you're not an angel, but right. <laughs> you know, like I, I mean, you know, it's frustrating. I, I love the pharmacy. I haven't seen a single, I haven't seen a single patient or s somebody who went on YouTube or, or Instagram is like, be like, Oh, I hate this guy because I, I ended up paying 760 bucks for this drug. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd love to turn the narrative someday into like, you know, that, and I'm not helping, right? I, I'm kind of making it worse, but I, I don't understand why pharma can't um, position itself as the company, the, the industry that does, and med tech that does great things. Um, if you look at say insulin or, or EpiPen, for example, I was on CBS one day and I was I getting grilled that, yeah. by some reporter and the reporter is like, oh, well, well, you know, why don't you know why why did Mylan raise the price of EpiPen so much? Which a lot of people confuse me for, for, for doing that. Yeah, yeah they, I, I remember that. I remember that. I was like, I was like, why are they pissed off at this guy again? Like he he had that's not his drug. But yeah, yeah. The Epi, so the, the EpiPen was like ten or twenty bucks, and it jumped to like five hundred or something. Or yeah, it was it, it was a big price increase, and and Mylan got a lot of flack. And I said, you know, I just looked at Mylan's ten Q, and I want to ask you, do you think Mylan makes more money than CBS on a on a Ooh. Profit margin what's, a ten, what's, a, what's a 10Q, by the way? Uh, 10Q is a quarterly filings that uh, every public company has to file with the SEC. And, you know, you can look up the profit margin for any company. And I said, I looked up CBS's and I looked at Mylan's. Who has a higher profit margin? CBS has a higher profit margin selling reality TV shows. So you're telling me the company that makes the EpiPen that saves your life, that this company is making too much money when their operating margins are like 8%. You know, what, how are they making so much money, you know, too much money? I mean, if their operating margins were 50% or 80%, that'd be different. Guess who's operating margins are high? Facebook's, you know, a couple of other companies. Like we're not, we're pointing the fingers to the wrong people. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Mylan, you know, I think they should make a lot more money. I mean, I, I think that there's nothing wrong with a company that makes life-saving goods, like they should have a little extra. Like, I don't think that the tech companies necessarily should have a little extra. I don't think the media companies, the food companies, the tobacco companies, if, if we should be mad at anybody, why are we mad at the companies that are making things that save our lives? And I think there's this, this fundamental disconnect. And I, I still, after having gone through the ringer, the best I take away of caught is that people treat healthcare with this very different part of their brain. They don't think about it as That's rationally true. as they'd like. Yeah, it's, you're absolutely right. I was going to say it's like, it's, it's 
it's it's all, like literally a different part of the brain compared to like any anything else. Like I think people are very they don't even think about it when they buy I don't know something random from Amazon and they know for a fact that like oh this thing I just spent thirty dollars for on it's like one dollar right. But but healthcare is a complete. Do you feel do you feel like it's because there's uh, it's considered like a social good and there's there's some level of entitlement for it. There's an expectation that that it should be provided for and provided for affordably. And I think that, you know, that's true to a certain extent, but it sort of belies this this the reality, which is that somebody has to make that stent. Somebody has to make that ICD. Somebody has to make that suture. Somebody has to make that medicine. Um, and if that medicine is made by a person, <laughs> you know, that person's costs come into play. And, and all these people that need to make that medicine have, or, or, or medical device are talented people that could do something else. And a medical, a med tech engineer could be a defense aerospace engineer, right? I'm sure there's crosstalk uh, between people who go from one to the other. And if you don't provide that incentive, there's going to be fewer med tech devices and more defense, de <laughs> defense, defense armament, you know, and, and so forth. I'm, I'm going to bring up a name from your past. I'm wondering, was this uh, person sort of, uh, in some way, a catalyst or inspiration in terms of why you went into pharma. But can you tell us a little bit about, uh, I might mispronounce it, Dr. Saltier? Yeah, doc, Dr. Saltier is a, was my psychiatrist, um, is, is my psychiatrist, and he's a fantastic uh, man. Oh, still? Uh, yeah. yeah. I, and, at least when I, was, when I was doing some research, this was somebody that you, you, you first got acquainted when you were younger? Yep. Got it. Yeah. I, is, I it okay? this, uh... is it okay for me to ask about it, by the way? No, no problem. I, I have this terrible panic disorder. Um, and I remember taking the, the That's subway. wild to hear considering the, like, you know, it, like <laughs> the, the absolute circus you went through with the media for the last, like, you know, eight, nine years. So I can only imagine what that did to you. Sorry, like, no, please continue. Ironic, like, this, this, like, I, I, in, in the forefront of my mind, I'm not afraid of anything or anyone. And prison was, was a testament to that. But the in the back of my mind, um, I have just these inexplicable solely clinical, you know, panic attacks, or at least I used to. And when I met Dr. Saltiel, um, he prescribed me a medicine, uh, and I take it faithfully to this day, which is venlafaxine. And um, it's just an SNRI, you know, sort of run of the mill, and it saved my life. I mean, if I, I couldn't do anything without, I was basically disabled. And, you know, thanks to, to that medicine, um, I could work on Wall Street, I could be a high performer. And it, to me, it was like the miracle of medicine. I met so many people. What were who, you like without it? I would, I would, I would take the, the train to work, uh, because uh, you know I would just do that, and and I would start to feel the room shaking, and and I would sit down on the train, and people would, like edge away from me and be like, "What's going on with this guy?" And because I couldn't stand up, I felt like I was going to faint or, or something like that. It's classic panic attack and panic syndrome and where you feel like for those, you're dying. Yeah, I was going to say as like so when I was in medical school, I learned about you know, panic attacks. And I never appreciated it until like, I forgot what I was doing. Uh, uh, but but I had like some, I, some stressful thing was going on in my life in, in medical school. And I had a panic attack. It, it, there's no other way to describe it. you feel like you're about to die. It is it's very, very intense. It's very scary. I, like I, I wish I would w wish it upon no one. Yeah, it's 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 a terrible illness. But there's others like one of my friends is cystic fibrosis. And she recently oh. um, started taking Vertex's new drug. I had a friend in high school. Oh, that's a great drug. Vertex yeah, is it's a, a, yeah. It's like a cure. And and again, you know, um, you know, my friend who passed away from cystic when he was 19, you know, that was the typical course, uh, you know, and I think that we should think about healthcare as an entitlement, but we should also balance that with, I, I actually hired some of the people who, who worked on Vertex's first CF drug. And, um, because it was such a miracle, uh, I like sought them out to get them, <laughs> and uh, the uh, it was just a drug that nobody thought you could make a small molecule for cystic fibrosis because the CFTR protein is this massive protein, and what do you what's a small molecule going to do right to fix that? It's like you can't do anything. You need a gene therapy or protein or something, and you have to deliver it in the lung. It's like this was not a disease anyone had on their radar that you could fix, but it was like the biggest rare disease for an oxymoron. So Vertex fixed it and Vertex is bigger than GM now. <laughs> and it's like, you know, such a great, to me, that's awesome. Like what, what could be cooler? And I think that we have to balance the fact that like, do the smartest people want to go work at Vertex or do they want to not become biotech people and instead work at Instagram where they're going to focus on how to get one more second of attention out of us or TikTok. Yeah. And I think no, no, that I, I, I wanna, agree. I, I want I a world where, where the smartest person out of Harvard says, I want to work at Vertex because, yes, I'm going to make 
a lot of money, but I'm also my engineering talents are going to be highly sought after, highly paid for, and I'm going to fix some diseases that people are suffering from. And I think that's a win. Whereas right now you got people coming out of college. They want to work at Y Combinator. They want to work in tech. They want to program, but to what end, you know, do they want to make the world a better place? I think we should exactly. incentivize a world where like, yeah, people do want to come out and say, I want to, I want to make a drug for, and, and the marginal choice between saying, I want to work at a startup in California, uh, in, in San Fran, or I want to become a biomedical engineer or become a medicinal chemist. I'm going to work in pharma. I, I, I want a world where, where there's tension between those two. And, and right now we're losing that battle yeah, where people don't very, want to very much. So, yeah. And, but, and it's kind of, it's kind of, it's almost laughable. Like I remember, like, again, I have nothing but respect for Y Combinator, but you know, they had this thing where they're like talking about, you know, their investments in like AI and healthcare. When you go look at the graph and I'm like, there's all these companies and there's like tiny little bit. It's like, that's the healthcare one. I'm like, Oh, it's real, real amazing guys. But yeah, you know, like it, because of that, because of the fact that we think about healthcare in a different part of our brain, everybody in healthcare also acts a certain way where it's like, if you make a lot of money, you have to be like, do not tell anybody about it, everything. And I think it's fine. There's a part of me where I, I do feel like if you're, I don't know, I won't name any names myself, but like if, if you're somebody who founded like a life, life, life saving, like med tech company, like you should ball out of control a little bit. So like Johnny or Sally, who's 16 years old is like, man, that person just rolled up in a Bentley or a freaking Lambo with, you know, I don't know, like, you know, so on the base part, team or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, you know, cause I feel like what, what could be cooler than making a lot of money and, and then answering the question, like, how did you make your money? It's like, oh, I came up with this thing that has like, that's a social good that actually has impact on people's lives versus like, you know, whatever. I, I mean, I, I, I don't want to use an example. It piss, just, I don't, I piss plenty of people off on, on this, on the show all the time, but it's funny you say that I, I I'm part of this group called EAC. And we're this like the effective accelerationism. Effective acceleration. You, you introduced so, me to that, and and I I want to talk about that, and and at some point we're going to segue into Doctor Doctor Gupta, but like yeah, tell tell me about EAC. EAC that's, is that's, a, that's very interesting. EAC is this idea that you know human potential is endless, and that we should stop at nothing but but accelerating it, and it's sort of an antidote to effective altruism, which is a little bit about what we were talking about a second ago, where it's like if you make a bunch of money, you have to be embarrassed about it. You have to be you know, really contrite. You have to be like, well, this money's going to go to the right place. Don't worry. And I'm going to prove to everyone that it's going to go to the right place. And I think that like EAC is kind of the antidote to that, where it's like the best investment you can make after making a billion dollars or something like that is investing in a Tesla or a Google or a company like Genentech or like a bunch of startups that are going to, you know, cure the next disease. You know, that is what's going to work. Giving it away uh, as, as, there are some good charities out there, but it's, it's a much less effective. It's less effective altruism to think about it that way. The most effective thing you could do is find the next XCOM, find the next, um, you know, Vertex actually acquired a company trying to cure type one. This has been a horrible, horrible, tough disease for so long. And investing in a company to cure type one, that's altruism. That's also something that could pay you back. And I think that, you know, that's the way we win. And I think e EAC is kind of this like, I wouldn't call it a cult. I wouldn't call it a, a, a movement. You know, it's, it's a different thing to everyone, but I think that it's a philosophy that, that allows for the making of money without feeling guilty about it. Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. like you can't take it with you. You can't really pass it on. As you know, like these generational wealth doesn't really even exist. You know, most people that, that get generational wealth lose it very quickly. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. you know, there's really not, look at the it, forms list. I mean, it's not a bunch of people who inherited it. That's true. Well, for EAC, is there a website that people can go and learn more about it? No how, how... We're a shadowy group of people. Our two founders. I was very early on the train. I think I'm like the uh, like uh, fourth or fifth, you know, cultist leader. Um, yeah, but there's no. Um, <laughs> What's the difference? Leader... Oh, sorry, sorry. Go... If... Our Pretty leader's sure name is the pseudonym. His name is Beth Jesus, and <laughs> the other one is named <laughs> Lord. So we're very like. Do you, do you have a pseudonym as well? I don't, you know, I'm one of the few people who's, who's not anonymous, but I, because like, one of my goals is to evangelize the group, but, you know, we have some of the most important people in Silicon Valley that are members. And I think that, you know, it's starting to take hold. I hope it expands to, to pharma and med tech because that's a field where there's very little of that vibe of, you know, I hate to say move fast and break things. Cause that's, that's, it's somewhat of a new no, no, but you're right. You're, you're kind of right. And, and at least, I mean, this is part of the reason why I started this show was like, I want, I want to make this industry great again. 
or I guess I just want to make this industry great. I don't know if there was a time where it was like, you know, amazing, right. but like, you know, I looked around. So like for me, uh, you know, I spent time on the product side, but I don't have a technical background. I'm, I'm more of a sales and marketing guy. Um, but even on the sales market, I'm like, we're losing talented people to go like sell BS, you know, so, you know, software for, I don't know, CRMs and stuff, you know, whatever. Yeah, the, 18th, the 18th CRM, the 18th productivity tool. Meanwhile, like one of the, oh, one of my favorite stocks from back in my hedge fund was more than 10 years ago was exact sciences, right? This is a company. Oh that's, yeah. 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 Like, one told lives. I mean, this is like a beautiful diagnostic that, you know, was amazing. I mentioned sequinome earlier, another one that's, you know, achieved the unachievable and, you know, you can do anything with med tech in a lot of ways, med tech is more powerful than pharma. And, you know, again, the incentive is open AI is paying a million bucks a year. You know, you're really smart. You can go work at open AI. You know, you're not necessarily going to, Grin and buried and work at Medtronic. I mean, people respond to real incentives. You just got married. You got some student loan debt. You got an offer on the table from OpenAI at, a, at one million bucks total compensation, no joke. And then you got an offer on the table from Medtronic for two hundred grand. I don't yeah, know too many no, people exactly. turn them down. It's, you know? Yeah, and I think you know you can um, you can persuade somebody psychologically to adopt a position where you're making less money, but you have to frame it and, and for them to understand it. And if you don't frame it, well, you can always lose. Uh, one last question on the EAC and, and, and move, move to, to Dr. Dr. Gupta, because there's aside from the platform, there's sort of like uh, some EAC ideas, obviously that involve Dr. Gupta, but with EAC, is there, is it safe to say that there's a, a, a part of EAC is the idea of singularity, right? And, and, you know, it's, being a technocrat, part of being EAC, do you have, do those have to go hand in hand? You know, can you kind of, you know, pull that apart for us? Yeah, there's very much this idea that that we're approaching a singularity and that our job is to accelerate it and, and that possibly we, you know, with AI and with other tools, you know, whether it's quantum computing or even things like digital biopsy, which I think is like one of the coolest or, or you know, I should say liquid biopsy, one of the coolest things to, to come ever come out, um, that we're approaching a world where conceivably we, we could either live forever or live double our lifespan or something like that. And I think a lot of that is, you know, EX different for everyone. I mean, to me, I think a lot of that is scientific fairy tale. Um, I like the idea of a singularity, especially when it comes to computing, but when it comes to human lifespan. I, I feel like we're not engineered for that. And that I think like the Silicon Valley guys, I'm sort of the one like biopharma kind of person, uh, even though I'm more of a software person these days, I still weigh in on all things kind of biopharma. And I think there's this like billionaire, expectation that if you throw enough money at biotech and med tech that you can live forever and it's a little naive and yeah. it's a little silly and Brian you know, Johnson's trying all... to do it at, at like what two million dollars a year you know he looks great though but <laughs> Larry like... Ellison Larry Ellison's been spending his whole fortune his whole life trying to live forever and it's not going to work for him I mean it's it's just not easy to you know change the you know the hundred million years you... of evolution we've gone through not to not to tell uh Uncle Larry how to spend his money but I mean do you feel like some of that money's better spent by just saying, you know, I could spend two or three million bucks this year on like extending my life, or maybe I should fund like 50 different startups and have more of a lasting legacy. Yeah. I mean, in, to some extent you can't actually, let me, two, I'm going to pull that yeah. back. You can with two, three, two, three million bucks. Maybe you can fund one or two startups in today's market. <laughs> look at that, yeah. I mean, he, he's got so much money, but I think like, if you look at Alzheimer's, like that, there's a huge, huge. <sighs> The, you know, the huge one there, there's, um, uh, this amazing, uh, amazing woman, in our industry, uh, Paula Rutledge, who's a recruiter and, you know, she has had people affected her family about Alzheimer's and, you know, I started to donate to it and she, she brought up a good point. She's like, you know, there's millions and millions of people are affected by it. It's like, you know, for breast cancer, it's a terrible disease. It's like a lot less people compared to Alzheimer's, but we walk around like it should, be, it's just a given. It's just like, we should just accept it. And it's, it's not acceptable. And I agree. That's you know? why I'm a big fan of like uh, new thinkers like Vivek Ramaswamy, who is a pharma bro himself, um, but, you know, um, is somebody that, you know, if, if you were to find his way in the White House, maybe not as president, but maybe as vice president or head of uh, HHS or something, Vivek uh, would probably do what's need, what needs to be done with Alzheimer's, which is a moonshot, like a Manhattan Project, um, because this is something that like pharma can't really touch because it, it's going to require more money which sounds crazy than even Pfizer has. <laughs> and um, like that, these that companies- That is really crazy. Like Pfizer spends 8 billion a year on R&D, right? So if they made their entire- That's kind of crazy that it's so little. That was the other thing that like, um, uh, you you know, I kind of got exposure to through you, which was uh, 
I didn't realize how little a lot of the pharma companies spend on R and D. I mean, one of the things I will admit that like you did, and I was like, man, that's, that takes some chutzpah was you, and it's still up. If you, there's this uh, website called pharmaskeletons.com where essentially you, you list out all these pharma companies and you kind of list out all the things that they did bad. And I'm like, wow, that it's, 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 do you, down do, you at regret, the moment. do you kind of regret doing that? Cause I feel like I mean, once it's all. out there, it's out there, but I like that's, a, that's a courage, man. That, that I, when I saw mm -hmm. it, I, well, I, I, felt, was really I felt uncomfortable about, looking at the website even. I was like, I was like, man, I, <laughs> I, I have to bring pharma skeletons back. I know somebody saved the URL when I went to jail. So I was really pissed when people like Ken Frazier, who I have a lot of respect for as the old CEO of Merck, who is the first black CEO of a really big American company. And I'm so <laughs> exalted and just happy about that. But at the same time, like people like him and others were like, oh, well, you know, Martin doesn't represent pharma. That's that's not us, you know? And I said, wait, well, hold on, hold on. Ken, Ken Frazier was an attorney <laughs> who was the general counsel of Merck who hid this Vioxx was, was killing people. And when he settled the, 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 the damage for 6 billion, that should have been settled for 60 billion, right? Uh, Bear is settling Roundup, which does nothing to you. It's Roundup safe, but they, they lost a case and it snowballed to this $20 billion issue. Vioxx wait. couldn't have taken Merck down completely. I gotta, and I gotta ask by, by promoting him to CEO, it, maybe he deserved it fine, but like point the finger at me for raising one measly drug, you know, drug price, but Viox was selling billions of dollars. <laughs> Meanwhile, they knew it hurt people. And you know, every drug company has a skeleton, every single one. And, and I really didn't like it when, when certain companies, some of them said nothing, which I appreciated. And some of them I was friendly with, but some of them who had the audacity to say, oh, Martin doesn't represent <laughs> Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Yeah, it was funny because like, uh, again, like, uh, back when all this was going down, I, I just started like my speaking circuit and like the pharma conferences pay way better than the med tech conferences. So I, that was my introduction to pharma was like speaking at these conferences. So when I was at pharma, I like kind of brought you up. I'm like, I was like, yeah, this Martin Shkreli guy. I was like, you know, he kind of brought up a good point. And like, immediately, like these people are like, like are you siding with him? Do you? And I'm like, whoa, I mean, can we just calm down? Like it was, it was, I don't know. It was like, it was like, I said a forbidden word or something, but like, I, it was I like, went to Pfizer, I was going to buy a drug from Pfizer. And I think in the pharma community, they knew that like, if Martin Scrawley calling you to buy your drug, it's probably underpriced. So we went to Pfizer, we offered close that's to a good billion. Heurist, that's a very good heuristic, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> we, we offered close to a billion dollars to buy this drug and uh, never, the deal never got done. Obviously we were going to raise the price of it. They said, no. We said, we're going to keep the drug. We pay, we were offered an exorbitant amount. And guess what Pfizer did? They raised the price of the drug themselves. They raised it quite a lot. And uh, was your, you know, your, nobody, your, nobody knows that story. And again, like, this is just what I'm, what I'm reading. But like, one of the things that I noticed was like, your, your, your reasoning for buying these drugs and then raising the prices was that you're, you're putting, you're shoveling like 30, 40% of it, of the profits back into like R and D that was, that was that kind of like the mission of Turing, which is like, let's buy these drugs, raise the prices. These insurance companies are going to pay for it. It's not going to hurt anybody. And we can take those profits and like make better drugs. And by the way, just for, for context for people, cause I have a lot of med reps who listen, but they don't look, I, I'm not an expert when it comes to insurance premiums, premiums and everything. But a lot of these drugs, when the prices get raised, it's not enough to change premiums. Like, I, I don't know why, like people think like, oh, like this is going to change, you know, change people's premiums or like, no, like you, well, you have to have a lot. If every single company did it, you know, it would change the premiums. Uh, but the problem is that you can't do it with every drug, right? There's a lot of competition. So if you raise the price of one Jack inhibitor, the other Jack inhibitor is going to say, well, you know, I take us, you know? <laughs> and so like, there's usually this like push and pull that occurs and there's a normal competitive dynamic. So you, you couldn't have the whole industry do it. Uh, and then when there's sole source drugs, I honestly think it's not such a bad thing because if, if the price, irrespective of whether you funnel the money back into R&D, which obviously we did, but even if it's a sole source drug, all that spurs is a second drug to come out, a, a generic. So like you'll permanently have these two drugs duking it out because I, I think it's a horrible place where you have to rely on one medicine for one disease from one supplier where like toxoplasmosis and cephalitis, which is what Daraprim treats, has had the same drug, Daraprim, as the main safe therapy for 70 years. And we know that whether it's coronavirus or other diseases, like you can't have one drug be the sole drug you use for an infectious disease. The organism is going to change. It's just going to happen. And you're going to have this wild strain of toxoplasmosis that's more deadly, or you could have a wild strain of coronavirus that affects half the world, whatever it is. We were actually looking into rare antivirals like dengue and other, other rare infections because... 
you know, somebody needs to make these. Uh, you know, of course, you know, I'm, I, you know, again, nobody could see coronavirus coming, but it was one of these things where it's like, you know, the world needs some preparation. It kind of dovetails with what we're talking about, where it's like it's okay for pharma to make money. It's it's not such a bad thing. I'd much rather have, you know, more expenses on healthcare, which is by the way has been going up from 1960. There are percentage of of rev, a percentage of GDP assigned to healthcare has gone up metronomically every year, and it's not because of people like me. It's because we demand healthcare. We love healthcare. We want to spend our money on healthcare because we want to be healthy. You know, it's it's a it's a demand side thing. You know, nobody wants. You know, there's you can't be satiated with with healthcare. You always want more healthcare. Nobody <laughs> says, "Well, I'm 80 percent healthy. That's okay. I want to be 100 percent healthy all the time." And that's something that medtech, pharma, we that's the promise we're here to fulfill. And and I don't think anybody should ever be ashamed of it. Yeah, and I, and very good segue by the way. But I was gonna say, as like you know, on that light, like, same same note. Like if you look at Instagram, some of the areas that have really exploded as topics are are like biohacking, the whole nutrition movement around like carnivore diet, all these things. And there's a reason because like we're very interested in like not only living longer, but like Fasting. living. I, I, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. If I, all this living like our optimal life, I mean, Peter Tia says it really well, which is like, you know, life should be like this, which is like, instead of like, if you're X, your, your X axis is your, is the years is like, as you go, you, you, you start getting worse and worse and sick and you die. It should just be like a straight line until one time, one day you just die, but you, you maintain the same level of health. So that being said with Dr. Gupta, something that some of the physicians are going to like this, but this is a fact It's not in my opinion. But if you look at healthcare expenditures, like pharma's pharma's a big part of that, but physicians are a much larger portion of our healthcare expenses. That being said, you know, uh, you know, physicians are definitely a large part of healthcare expenditures. And so, my, you know, I'm wondering, you know, after you know coming coming, you know, after after you become a free man, like why go start a generative AI company like Dr. Gupta versus like let's say another pharma company like. How did Dr. Gupta come to light? And, and let's maybe the first question, the better better first question is like, what what is Dr. Gupta? Sure. So Dr. Gupta is is an AI doctor. You know, the, the goal is that uh, one day I think that there actually won't be human doctors anymore. I think that we're going to live in a world. I don't know what year that is, if it's 2040 or 2050 or 2150. But I think that we'll live in a world where the idea of a doctor will be uh, passe or, or antiquated or anachronistic. And you know, there'll be uh, our kids or great grandkids or whatever generation will say, I can't believe that there was a person in charge of your health and you would go miles to go visit this person. And they were like really revered and you pay them a lot of money and and they would they would uh, come up with the right solution. And, and they'll laugh at it the same way we, we laugh at other anachronisms. And I think that AI is a big part of that. Um, what OpenAI has done, OpenAI has done and similar companies is just astounding. You know, if you haven't interacted with ChatGPT, um, I've seen some studies that show that that physicians are interacting with ChatGPT every day. Um, yeah, it, it uh, scored some, like nine, above ninety percent of the USMLE Step One, which is pretty pretty remarkable. Yeah, and we we are, are at the forefront of different techniques to get the most out of GPT. Not all GPT is is created equal. So like, there's some papers you have out to there. Train it right. Well, it's training, uh, fine tuning, but also it's 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 almost like it's it's such a, like a weird ghost in a machine. But we've done all these different algorithms. Um, we have one really good one up our sleeve that's not part of Gupta, but hopefully will be soon. Uh, but like, for example, the, the big one is called uh, Tree of Thought or Chain of Thought. So if you string together these prompts and their results, which is what Gupta does, you can kind of create this semi-sentience, which is really eerie um, and, and kind of remarkable. And the other thing that GPT doesn't do that, that we do is, is you have to give it a memory. So we, we have, like many others, we have this like vector store that, that allows the Gupta to remember everything he knows about you. And the other thing we do is, is we feed it new, new, new stories and new articles from PubMed every day. So you have this like, kind of like generic intellect that can really tackle health problems, which is, is really neat. And I think that doctors will, will always be around in a lot of ways, but I think that a lot of the questions we have for physicians, like, I don't know, just speaking for myself, like I always remember what to ask my doctors when I leave the office. <laughs> so I always want to like, send them a text or send them an email or something like that. But most people don't have that kind of relationship with their doctor where they can text their doctor and get an answer or have that or have that kind of access. I, yeah. you know, I mean, maybe, I'll maybe make, Bill Gates I'll make, has that, but I don't. Yeah. maybe Bill Gates, yeah. <laughs> well, and I'll, I'll make some of like my own prediction, which is like, I, I personally don't think chat GPT is going to make anybody unemployed in the next 50 years. If anything, I, I kind of see this like, okay, like when I looked at Dr. Gupta, I kind of feel like this is similar to when, um, 
uh, computers were introduced to libraries. Like librarians were freaking out and they're like, we're, we're going to lose our jobs and everything. It actually created more librarian jobs, you know? Absolutely. And, so I see, not- and if anything, I think Dr. Gupta will allow uh, doctors to focus on tackling challenges that are that are that they're more interested in doing versus like there's just a lot of minutia that and i again like how, the way the healthcare system has solved for this is like okay let's just employ more pas and nurse practitioners and nurses and stuff so on and so forth but like if you're out in the middle of nowhere or like look i live i live in socal sometimes i want to go get an appointment with my primary care it's gonna it take me like two months and i'm like i don't have two months really <laughs> two months yeah yeah. Wow. Well, you know, there was, yeah, there was, there, <laughs> I was, I was trying to get a new doctor. Um, well, sp- so specifically I was trying to get an appointment with a cardiologist and the one that I wanted, uh, they're like, we don't have an opening for like two months. And I'm like, great. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. Nobody has anything good to say about the doctor experience, right? It's like the worst experience in the world. If you, if you grew up like I did, I, I, um, our parents would take us to the emergency room. Right? Oh, that's so smart. That's a shortcut. <laughs> shortcut to a doctor, actually. Is, some, is a place where the urban community often will go as a last resort. Um, and if you don't speak English, right? You and I are lucky. You know, if you don't speak English um, and you go see a doctor, you don't get treated that great. If you're that's like, true. you know, I, I had a family member recently go to the doctor and English isn't their first language and they felt like they were dismissed. They felt like they were... Their questions were not important. And, you know, I think a lot of people of color have the same issue. People who don't speak English as a first language, people don't speak English at all. You know, they, they, their health care is much worse than, than anyone else's. People who aren't in America, you know, everyone I've talked to who has criticism of Dr. Gupta, I asked them, well, what do we do about the guy in Iran? You know, this, the government of Iran reached out to us. Like, you know, there, there, there are really? countries, New Why? Zealand, New Zealand and the UK and other countries reached out to us as well, asking like, well, can we deploy this nationwide? Is there a way to, to, to do this? Because if you can cut, like you said, that 5%, the worst 5% of the, I got to say this politely, the most wasteful kind of doctor inquiries, like I'm sniffling, should I go to the doctor and get an antibiotic? Maybe stay at home and, and, and wait a couple of days. Uh, you know, if you get better, it sounds like you got a cold, which is exactly what a doctor would tell you <laughs> uh, 99 times out of 100. Uh, I have this rash on my neck. Is that something to be worried about? You know, and of course, you know, it, it's it's a good idea to see a dermatologist, but the I think there's a lot of our we use healthcare, healthcare utilization is is often wasteful. In fact, probably half of healthcare utilization is 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 completely wasteful. And that, you know, other countries do this by rationing health and limiting access to healthcare and limiting information. But a lot of the reason the healthcare is wasteful is because there's a lack of information. What large language models do is they compress the whole internet into this little box. And you can retrieve from the box a real answer as opposed to Google, where, you know, the indexing search method is, is great. We've used it for so many years, but I think Google's going to go the way of the dinosaur because on Google, if you said, well, you know, what are the, the key symptoms of psoriasis? Well, <laughs> Google's going to look for... And everything a, a leads doctor. to cancer. Like we, 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 we had this joke when I was in medical school, where we're like, we're like, we're like studying a new section. It's like, it's like, oh man, like I think I have cancer, you know, right. it's just like, you know. So Google, kind of like the WebMD will, effect. Yeah, Google will give you a web page, probably from WebMD or whatever, whoever's hacked the SEO game. They'll give you a web page, and the web page you hope will be relevant to you. But the problem is it, it'll be like, okay, 10 symptoms of psoriasis. But if your question is, well, I take steroids because I have this other thing. What, what about me? Well, Google doesn't have a, a search engine for you, right? But the LLM has all that information in one, and it, it has these like – almost remarkable like properties to, to be able to give you like really distinct advice. So like I fed it some of the New England Journal um, case studies that, that come out every week, the, 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 the sort of clinical mysteries, and was able to like come up with like the most incredible answers. So I was surprised. I started it because uh, when GPT's API came out, I, I said, well, let me try this. And one of the first things that came to mind was, you know, let me give it some, let me give it some medical well, questions and see what, if it'll what are you doing. I was gonna say, what were you doing at the time? Because like, so Dr. Jupe, it is, it's a company you guys are, you know, that you can, you know, you can use it for free to a certain extent. And then after that, I think it's like 20 bucks a month. But prior to that, like, what the hell were you doing? You know, cause you had just been, you just left prison, like you're hanging out, you know, what, what, what were you doing that you're like, this is the company I'm going to start next. Cause like, that's, that's, that's a hell of a risk, right? Cause like your, your backers is like hedge funds and pharma. So like, you know, how, well, how and yeah, why so, <laughs> I have so many questions. <laughs> I love software. When I was a kid, I, I programmed all day and all night. And I, uh, 
gave, uh, I never programmed in a professional environment. Uh, when I was arrested, I actually took some time off and I said, I'm going to prepare for my case. I'm going to quit my drug companies and I'm going to let them manage themselves. Um, and in, in my spare time, I, I, I picked up, you know, sort of more professional programming and I really fell in love with my kind of original love, which was software. So I was messing around with all kinds of different software. And then when GPT came out, it was, it was kind of like this revolution. It was just, you know, trying to talk to machines for the last 30 something years and having for the first time they start talking back. It's like, it's, it's almost like that movie contact or something. It's like <laughs> you ask, you say hi to the computer. Normally the way you get it to respond would be something like, well, if the user says hi, say hello, you know, and then if the user says hi, but they misspell it, the, the machine says error, error, error. Um, you know, but with LLMs, like, I, I, I've programmed so many different unique LLMs that, you know, they're, they're really remarkable. I think that physicians that don't rely much on medical testing, like a psychiatrist, for example, is probably the best place to start with something like Gupta because, you know, a psychiatrist doesn't take your blood levels. A psychiatrist doesn't physically examine you. If they're doing that, they're probably going to lose their license soon. I think that most of the time a psychiatrist just talks to you and says, hmm, you know, I think this patient has this, that. So are you saying, are you saying like, cause that was, that's an, that's a very interesting angle. Cause you know, I have, I have a large like physician audience that listens like, so aside from patients, your, your suggestion is that like physicians should actually go and, and, and use, use Dr. Gupta. I guess if you're feeding it all this information, I mean, there's millions of papers on PubMed and there's no, like, this is the one thing, like when I left medical school, I remember thinking about this like 10 years ago, I was like, man, I was like, how is it that you can just keep up? Cause even back every Impossibly. physician would, oh yeah, they would always say they're like, look, and it was actually a thing that they told us in our second year, like, look, by the time you graduate medical, like medical school, like 50% of the things you're going to learn is, is going to be antiquated 50%. And I was like, how do we, how do we overcome that? It's like, well, there's, you know, you, you, you attend, you do continuing medical education conferences. I'm like, that's not going to, I don't know if that's going to keep up with like the hours I was of studying, I was putting in every single day, you know? And I think like back then it was just sort of like, like sort of a, a collective Un, you know, uh, you know, consciousness where it's like, you know, you have all these minds working and studying papers and everything. And then you go together at the like one annual conference and talk about it, present everybody gets up to date and you leave. But the world's changed. It's just like more stuff, more information. There's more like mental illnesses. Like 15 years ago, we didn't have social media the way we do today. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm sure there's all kinds of pathologies that are a result of Instagram that we don't talk about. Yeah, it's impossible to keep up. I mean, imagine being a dermatologist and, and do you have time to go to the 20 major oh dermatology God. conferences? Do you have time to read the 30 different journals? Do you have time to, I mean, there's, it's, it's, it's do you, really. Do you uh, feel like this is the reason why like healthcare got more expensive because the way that we would solve for this is it's almost like, uh, like Navala Ravikant has these like four, uh, four levers of, uh, uh, four forms of leverage, like labor, capital, media, and code. And before we had media and code, like the idea is like, okay, well, it's too difficult to know all this as a single dermatologist. So like, let's have specialties and subspecialties and subspecialties. Like that's how we solve for this. But now we have code and, and it's, and that's, this is where like the big shift. Do you, do you feel like that's the right way to think about it? I do. I mean, I think that, that normally labor markets will adjust to reflect demand. We demand more and more healthcare, but if you actually look at the number of doctors graduating, um, it, we don't have the supply to keep up with that. And the, the question is, and why, why and why is that? Yeah. I was going to say, and why I, is that? I have a cynical, cynical idea. Right. And it's, it's that, you know, if you keep a uh, supply artificially, uh, low, uh, we all know what happens to price, which is that it, it remains very, very high and that we could easily graduate, you know, double the amount of doctors that we graduate now. But, you know, of course the AMA and others would say, well, what about the quality? The quality will be much worse. And while I understand that, I also point you to the fact that, you know, in JAMA recently, GPT's answers were as rated as good uh, by blinded physician group, as good as real doctors. And the bedside manner was also rated higher. So <laughs> that was it, that was the part that blew my mind when I saw that the bedside manner was like rated really high. It's like because that that's kind of like the one pushback with AI. It's like, well, you know, you always want the human touch, but it's like, well, unless you can train it on human touch, then it's just going to be that much better. If you get the good human touch, I, I get treated like a rock star when I go to the doctor. But the problem is if, if you are not treated like a rock star, you're treated like dirt, if, 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 which some people are. And it's an inconvenient truth, but some people fear going to the doctor. I know there's a lot of minorities that don't love going to the doctor because they feel like it's a system that is – rigged against them or it's not really for them. And I think that you see well-established evidence of that. Uh, and then again, if you don't speak English really well, the doctor kind of looks at you and says, well, this is somebody I don't need to 
you know, sort of take seriously. And even though maybe one out of 10 doctors do that, if that, it still leaves such a bad taste in people's mouth. GPT doesn't know what you look like. GPT doesn't care, right? It's, it's this uh, really nice kind of neutral thing. And again, it doesn't have to be the answer for everything. I think that, you know, my vision of, of there not being doctors is a long-term vision. I think that as we get like entire labs that we could fit on a chip, uh, like a Dexcom for everything, not just insulin. Um, you know, one day maybe we'll have that where you can hit your iPhone and, and check your hemoglobin or check your oh whatever. My God. You know, it would be. I would. Be great. I would pay for that in a in a heart heartbeat. Yeah. Like like this. Like again, like talking about people's demand for healthcare. So I don't, I'm sure you've noticed it, but like in the last few years, all these independent like cash only blood testing facilities. Like everybody, like even including me, like I'm looking for a place where I can test my blood, you know, quarterly even, you know, like people, people were all about it. People were buying. Um, and, and this is the part where I was like, wow, like healthcare is the place to be like my, my, my sh like narrow minded, some of my narrow friends who are a little bit narrow minded about tech and they're like, Oh dude, why are you going back to med tech? Like, why don't you stay in tech and SAS? I'm like, dude, like, look, we're living in a world where on Instagram, I'm seeing, um, uh, uh ads, uh, I forgot what it's called, but essentially the device that you can stick to your arm, just like usually it's for insulin, but this is like just to monitor your blood. And it kind of tells you like your insulin spike for, for certain foods. Normal people are paying two, $300 a month cash for this information. Yeah. You know, no like, it's wild. It. We're going to see more, more so, and more huge innovations like that. So let me, I'm going to fast forward. Well, let's say it's, 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 so today it's 2023. Let's fast forward to 2060. Okay. So 2060, I don't know. I'm I'm not so good with math in my head, but you and I are older. Okay, we're hanging out. We're doing another podcast, and millions of people are using Dr. Gupta, right? And Dr. Gupta has made like an actual impact on healthcare. What does that workflow look like? So, I, let's say I'm a patient in you know just some city, and I and I I have a stomach ache, right? What's the workflow look like for that patient if they are going to if Dr. Gupta has this big impact and is used by millions? Well, it's certainly a fantasy looking 40 years into the future, but I, I, I do think like, you know, whether it's a iPhone or an app and I can abstract my own brand away from this. Like, I think there'll be a computer that will be able to monitor your health in really granular detail, real time. Um, it'll also be able to monitor things like um, the different mutations that are happening in your cells. Uh, for example, the, the, this is already happening with liquid biopsy. We, you're, you know, I think going to take that product from Grail, um, which is probably the next great med tech company, say once a year. You think, Grail, you think Grail's the next big great net med tech company? I do. I do. I mean, there are a number of, of similar companies that are public, uh, but I think the idea that you can take this this biopsy every year uh, pretty painlessly and determine if you potentially have cancer is an incredible thing. So finding the clonality of these cells and kind of like if there's a mutation there is something we may be able to do in an automatic way where we, we sort of have each of us has like a Dexcom attached to us and there's a mini lab kind of in the Dexcom and, and you can look real time, not that you would need to, but you can look real time at things like cholesterol and other, you know, um, important <laughs> metabolic panels. And then you, you'll have that interpretation immediately with something like Dr. Gupta or another AI tool that says, emails you and says, hey, Omar, your, your um, LDL is starting to, to get into worrisome territory. Can you consider maybe cutting back on, <laughs> and it knows what you ate and all that stuff and says, so forth. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I think that's, I think that's the world we're going to live in at some point. And just kind of expand on that. Like, look, just as, a, as, as an example, I mean, uh, funny enough, and we didn't talk about this, but like, uh, I do have, uh, uh, you know, some issues with my cholesterol. Right. And so there was a period like, uh, last year where, you know, I am on some cholesterol medication, but there's a point where I was like full on carnivore. Like I was eating like eggs in the morning. I was eating like liver, heart, and you know, like I was eating a lot of red meat. You know, I think red meat's very good for you, uh, but like not the quantities I was eating last year. And then like I went to my doctor, we got some blood drawn, it came back, my triglycerides, everything was out of whack. So like give or take, it was a solid 30 to 60 days for me to get those tests, execute them, get it back, say, okay, I got to make some changes and make those changes versus like, I mean, and I'm a, I'm a healthy guy, like 36 days is a long time. And for the average person, it might've been longer because maybe they just, a lot of people, like, especially men, men are really bad about going get, like usually most men, especially minority men as a token brown guy, um, minority men usually don't go to the doctor ever until, unless they're like literally dying. Yep. And so I think like these kind of advents with technology, um, 
can serve as a nudge to make the behavior changes, right? Well before, let's say, pharmaceutical drugs are needed. And I think that's like probably the more, one of the more exciting things. That was kind of the thing that I saw with Dr. Gupta, which by the way, can I share you, I'll share with you, I was considering whether I should share or not. I'll share with you my patient story with Dr. Gupta. It's just, because this has just happened last night. So, so last night, uh, my son, uh, who's a little over a year old, uh, had a really bad fever, okay? Now, having been through medical school, knowing my son, I knew what it was, but I was like, at that time, like, you know, I was like, you know, we, we got him taken care of, but I was like, let me go to Dr. Gupta and I just want to see. <laughs> you see the sweat dripping down my forehead, <laughs> even though we've yeah, had a, uh, hundreds of thousands of users, I'm still nervous. <laughs> so, so I went to Dr. Gupta and I was like, okay, I'm going to put this to the test now and see like, if this is, this is legit because like, I already went through the work medical workflow in my head and, and, you know, it worked. And so I, I went through it and told Dr. Gupta, I'm like, hey, my, my son is this old. Uh, and he and I, I pretended to be like an actual like patient. Like, I'm not going to think of all these like fancy. I'm like, hey, I have a 13 month old baby and he's really hot. What do I do? And within like a few answers, it went through a really good workflow and kind of gave me some ideas of what it could be. Right. And then what it suggested I should do was exactly what I ended up doing like prior to going to Dr. Gupta. Like I ended up treat, you know, uh, giving him uh, uh, ibuprofen, right? But it was it was really good. And like within a couple minutes, I had that answer. And, and what was remarkable, what I was thinking, I was like, okay, if I took myself, again, as somebody who didn't go to medical school, doesn't know anything about, about medicine and did what most people do these days, which is they just go to Google, right? So I went to Google and put the same thing. It was, it was a mess. Right. And if anything, like I was thinking, I was like, if I was a regular patient, this would have given me a lot more anxiety. And so I was really impressed with, I, I was impressed with the workflow of doctor. Again, I, I just used it one time, that one time, but like, it was good. That, it served like, its purpose. I, I'm, I'm obviously overjoyed with that, but I'd also like consider the fact that like, you're a brilliant guy, you know, you went through med school. Think about the guy who isn't brilliant, right? Think about the woman. Yeah, exactly. Think yeah, about the exactly. That, that only speaks Spanish, you know? That's where this L LLMs really are trained in all languages. Yeah, they, they speak Actually, all languages. I should have my, I should have my yeah, I sh you know, I should have my wife uh, later uh, try it also in Turkish. Yeah, we tried Turkish. Uh, we, we, we tested almost every language. There are a few African languages it's not very good at. But in general, like to me, like you and I and uh, like uh, I said, a snarky journalist or somebody that invested $100 million making a symptom checker over the last five years and now is looking at these LLMs that can do 100 times that. You know, there are a lot of snarky people out there that would look at Gupta and say, well, you know, have some complaint about it. Like, well, this should be regulated or, you know, that's not fair. <laughs> you know, uh, Farmer Bro figured yeah. something clever out. I think that I mean, the, the reality is- You guys is do have a, you have a disclaimer where you're like, this is not a real doctor, so on and so forth. But again, like, look, again, I'm trying to look at it from like, uh, I'm, I'm a positive guy, you know? And so um, I, I will say like, before I reached out to you and everything, like I did a lot, I did a decent amount of due diligence and I had my own skepticism about Dr. Gupta, but like, you know, I, I think it has, has great potential. Like, look, perfect example, which is like, it's, ex it's almost textbook, which is appendicitis, right? There's some like textbook things for appendicitis, but, but for a lot of people, like one of my friends who had appendicitis when we were kids, he was in high school because I knew about it, right? When I was, I think I was, how old was I? 21, 20 years old. And he had appendicitis and he was telling me, he's like, dude, he's like, I have this pain here. It hurts a lot. And again, I was wanting to go to medical school. So my dad's a general surgeon. And had I not told him like, dude, I think you have an appendicitis. We need, like, we should go talk to my dad. Long story short, we went to my dad. My dad's like, this is a pet. Like you need to, we need to go to surgery now. We went to surgery. My dad peeled back the fascia and it was like a lot of us. Like he would have died. He would have gone septic and died. And seeing something like Dr. Gupta, I think how many people out there, like some guys working out in the field or just, just, just an av your average Joe has appendicitis is hurting. Right. And it's just like, Oh, I probably had like some bad food or I just have gas. They take like, I don't know, some Tums, this is like Tums and everything. And it gets worse and they go septic and die. Yeah. Right. Versus like, if you go to Dr. Gupta, just like some simple prompts, like it will tell you like this is appendicitis. You need to go to the emergency room. Yeah, and yeah. we're working hard to improve Dr. Gupta. For example, like we spent the last several weeks working on speech to text, text to speech, so full loop um, speech. So you don't have ever have to type anything to Dr. Gupta. So I oh, think that's, that's great. Gonna help. Yeah, it's going to help a lot. I don't know when we'll roll, roll it out, but I think pretty soon. I think it's going to help the, the average person who really needs healthcare is not the twenty five year old uh, journalist uh, or the you know 
40 year old sort of med tech entrepreneur. It's, it's the 65 year old who is maybe not the most computer savvy, doesn't want to sit there and peck away at a, at a chat um, all day. And I think that we're going to try really hard to make that easier. We're adding therapists at some point soon. So I think therapy is one of these things that, you know, is even kind of, it's harder technologically actually, but it's easier from a patient interaction kind of thing. Obviously there are some cases like oncology where I'm not sure Dr. Goop is going to help you that much other than be a good well of information, but you know, um, issues like that, where you're really relying on, on, on MRIs or CAT scans or, or other like blood data, you know, Gupta can, can work with you, but it's really best just going to be a second opinion. You need a real doctor to examine you, but things like, like psychotherapy, which is sort of, it, it, it is medicine in a way. Um, but it's, it's this very, you know, kind of different part of medicine. You know, many people, like we mentioned, men, men really don't like going to therapy and more men should. I wish I went to therapy years ago. There are a lot of issues that we do need to work out, men, women, everyone. And therapy can be very much stigmatized. It can be very expensive. It's often not covered by insurance. It's very difficult to go, go to therapy. If you're depressed, you don't want to do anything, let alone walk over and schlep to a therapist and, and lie down. Absolutely. You know, so yeah. I think there's going to be a lot of potential there. Uh, I think nutrition uh, and diet, which we often uh, forget about as part of medicine, um, and most doctors feel like they're kind of above that. Um, I think that's something that can be really valuable here. So I, I like the whole idea of having like this panel of AI health experts to help you. And of course, you know, we may one day integrate physicians into Dr. Gupta, where Dr. Gupta really thinks that you need to see an actual physician. Maybe you can press a button and, and get connected to one. Yeah, that would be pretty cool because like, you know, like a telemedicine component, but like, I'll tell you, like between, like, if I have to check anything between, I don't know, doing a telemedicine appointment, which is kind of a pain uh, sometimes and like going to Dr. Gupta, like I'll, I'll definitely be just going to Dr. Gupta first. Cause like I, for the most part, you're feeding it all, all the relevant, uh, data and studies and publications out of PubMed. And I think for like a lot of basic things, you know, even non-basic things, I think it's like a very, very useful tool. Um, you know, on this, on the topic of like nutrition, sorry, I'm, I'm taking, I'm, I'm going to take a hard right here because like, I just, I need to ask you about this, but like, if you look at the nutrition in this country, I I'm convinced like our food is killing us. Like if you, if you look at, um, the amount of seed oils that are in things and forget about seed oils. Cause I feel like that's like the buzzword everybody's using, but yeah. just a lot of unnatural things that are put in our food, like simple thing, pork chip, pork rinds, pork rinds are pretty healthy for you. Cause it's just like protein. Right. But like one, one pork rinds is like pork skins, vinegar, salt, and that's it. The other ones have got like yellow five, all these different things. Like our, our food's like literally killing us. Not to mention that, uh, what is it? The white house council on nutrition. They put like frosted Wheaties and like, uh, like kale as like the top foods. And they said like steak and butter was like at the bottom. Like, um, that all being said, can you explain to me and the audience, uh, why does, why did bear and Monsanto emerge? That's something that a lot of people don't know. And I, I tell people like, did you know that bear and Monsanto merged? They're like, they're like, that's not true. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it is. It happened. Yeah. Why, I, I don't why have, is that? I don't necessarily have the answer, but I'd say that like one of the things I was asked about at this Forbes summit was um, healthcare and and kind of like the environment and healthcare. And the environment and healthcare, at least for pharma, for a while was pretty bad. It's recently doing better, uh, partially from TLPs and COVID. Uh, but the environment for healthcare was, was what, kind what's of what's a TLP. Oh, sorry, GLP, the glucagon-like uh, peptides oh, that, oh. Uh, like Ozempic, that are that are selling like crazy. But for a while, pharma was was struggling, and um, you know, to some extent, each company that in pharma has had this like one saving grace, like Keytruda saved Merck, COVID saved Pfizer, uh, and and uh, GLP saved Novo, and these other companies. So, like, and some of these other companies haven't had a saving grace. But ultimately, you know, pharma was kind of on on the outs uh, when I raised the price of Daraprim, and I said that. You know, Bayer has a choice. Bayer can make more medicine, uh, more prescription drugs, or they can do something else. And they chose very loudly at that time to merge with Monsanto, uh, which is a seed agricultural company. And they decided to spend, you know, $50 billion or $60 billion on Monsanto and not on Biopharma, which they could have. And I think that was telling that, you know, you saw people with a choice saying, Pfizer doesn't have a choice. Pfizer has to be in medicine. But you saw people with a choice saying, you know what? I have had enough medicine. Maybe let, let me try something different that has a better growth profile or a better sort of um, you know risk profile. And I think that medtech, for example, is one of those areas. Now we haven't seen like this cross company for in a while, and J and J is obviously kind of seems to be in the process of dissembling instead of assembling. But I think that the Bayer Monsanto deal was was a sign of like pharma saying 
at least one pharma saying, you know, I've maybe had enough of medicine. And obviously Monsanto was the worst stroke of luck Bear ever had, because as soon as the deal closed, Roundup uh, sort of got attacked by the tort industry. I personally think, and I think the U.S. government has said that Roundup is safe. Uh, I don't know for sure, obviously, but um, the uh, you know they've settled that for sort of twenty, thirty billion dollars. It was the first time in Bear's three hundred year history where they potentially were at the risk of of going under, uh, which again shows you just sort of how powerful the, the legal world is. Um, and I think that you know Bear has sort of weathered that storm now, but is sort of a weaker company uh, at this point and and less in pharma than than maybe they've ever been. Seeds are now their biggest ag is their biggest uh, area. So, you know, it's it's hard to know exactly why they did the deal. I think that they thought they were getting a good deal. And obviously, Roundup was uh, not what they asked for. Yeah, no, I thought it, it, it was it was interesting to say the least. But it's 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 amazing how many people in my industry actually like are unaware of on the topic of like, I'm kind of curious your take on J&J. Like you said, like, yeah, and you're right. Like, it's more disassembling. Can you kind of expand on that and tell me, like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, um, I, go, I go way back with J and J when they bought Synthes, you know, the big big orthopedic company in, in Switzerland. That was a interesting deal because they did the deal it was a very expensive price, and they did it with stock and cash. So at the time, Warren Buffett uh, and I both said that this was a bad deal. Uh, and what, we, what year was it when they got uh, Depew? Because I have a lot, I have a lot, a lot, a lot of reps from Depew who who listen to the show. So go, go into that a little because they're going to love that this because they, they have no idea. That was well before, I, I want to say that was the 90s or early 2000s, but J&J didn't have an ortho business. And, you know, they bought, uh, they expanded by buying Synthes. They kind of like doubled the size of their business, especially in the extremities world. So Synthes was huge in extremities, not so big in hips and knees. And so the problem I had with Synthes is so J&J stock, just had a backdrop, had been $60 for the last 10 years. And it's just been not going anywhere. And even though the revenue had been growing and the earnings had been growing on the back of like Remicade and Risperdal and stuff like that, they still – the stock didn't budge, and, and we were just buying the stock and waiting and buying and waiting, and uh, they bought Synthes, and it was kind of the last straw for both Buffett and myself, and we were both very wrong at the time because that was like the last time J&J stayed at 60, and since then it's gone up and up, uh, so it just shows you <laughs> you get things wrong sometimes, but – they bought Synthes, including with with stock, and usually a big company like that, you just use debt. You just borrow money and, and leave it at that, but they kind of used uh, stock. And that kind of ticked us off because it was like as unnecessary dilution, but it actually was was it, it proved out to be irrelevant whether they use stock or cash, and they they did just fine after that. They have recently, as you know, they spun off the consumer business, and my guess is they're going to spin off the med tech business, and that's a good thing. What's weird about corporate America over the last say thirty or forty years has been the death of the conglomerate, you know, and and this has arguably been a good thing, you know, when companies spin off like Abbott spun off AbbVie, both companies seem to do better after the fact. J&J uh, spinning off consumer, certainly GSK spinning off uh, uh, their consumer business, and Pfizer spinning off Zoetis. All these like spinoffs end up creating companies where, where that sole company is a lot more focused and a lot more um, success. You know, the old reason- You have more room for innovation too, because like- I mean, just to get things approved to do anything, I mean, for, forget about the product side, but just the sales right. and marketing side, it's just, you're extremely limited. Like the, the level of committees is just insane. You might as well just, you yeah. just don't do, do anything. Right. The CEO at Pfizer is like animal health. We have an animal health division. Oh yeah. It's 20% of our revenue. Ah, whatever. You know, it doesn't get the attention and the, the, the tender love and care that it needs. So I think the spinoffs are a good idea, but in the old days, conglomerates were really, really great. And Warren Buffett runs a conglomerate, Berkshire Hathaway. Where, you know, if you give autonomy and you give real power to people, to managers, they can do great things. But again, the power, the problem comes, like you said, with big investments, like an acquisition or something like, can, you know, you do a huge acquisition as a manager at a company. It's really not easy to filter that all the way up. You need the autonomy to just do it immediately. So all the death of the conglomerate change is like the last company standing in the sense that, and Roche as well has a big diagnostics business, but both are kind of like, asking themselves, does it make sense to be, to have these like very different divisions? To be divisions? like that big. Yeah. yeah. Do, you, do you feel like, like, you know, so like the last, to, from what I can remember, at least in Medtech, the last like big acquisition where I was like, sweet God, that's massive, was uh, Medtronic acquiring Covidian for like 48 billion in cash. I feel like we're kind of done with those days, like these big transformative acquisitions and more CEOs are becoming more uh, conservative to say like, hey, we're going to buy these more like tuck in deals, like billion dollars or less, unless it's something we really, really need. Like J&J really needed robots that they bought for us for like 3 billion and 
uh, more than three billion. But like, I, I feel like we're we're getting away from those like big transformative deals. Do, do do you feel that way? I think so too. I mean, I think that you know when it comes to med tech, you know, there's probably going to be some deconsolidation. So like, you've had a lot of consolidation. And I wonder if like you look at Medtronic and you look at some of the other companies that have merged and merged and merged, including Abbott, that, you know, maybe they think that like they're still too focused. Like could Abbott do better if Nutrition's was a separate company, Nutritionals was a separate company, or could they do better if, if, you know, they spun off uh, some of their businesses? Cause there isn't a lot of overlap, you know, in some of these things like neuromodulation is sort of like sticks out like a sore thumb for some of these companies where it's like, well, where does that go? You know, like, is that a, a business that it makes sense for us to have, or does it need its own investment profile? Does it need its own? Why do you, can you, can you, can you, can you expand on that? Like why, why, do, why do you feel that neuro, neuromodulation kind of sticks out like a sore thumb for some of these companies? Well, it's really innovative. No offense to anybody. <laughs> it's, the it's neuromod really people are going to be like, like what the hell, Shkreli? But, but yeah, no, no, no. But you, you have you have a very good point. Please expand on it. No, I mean, I, I think that like when, when Neuromod first came out, when DBS first came out, it was like this this miracle in a sense because it was like – And for those listening, you know, DBS is deep brain simulation. Yeah, yeah, so, was, sorry, please was, continue. Yeah, for people with with like certain – like when I was, work, I was working on this really rare neurodegenerative disease, you know, we think of DBS just for Parkinson's. But there's certain, certain dystonias, genetic dystonias where DBS can be, you know, a huge lifesaver. And the question is like can we – invest more in that space and find new uses and, and like explore this technology. And med tech is kind of this field where the, the R and D part of med tech tends to be like very much not very incremental. It's not like a big leap, uh, a big moonshot because there's this like profile where you have like, that's why people, don't, ne- people don't like to invest in it. <laughs> yeah. It's like the smokestack <laughs> business where like you have all this revenue and earnings and you're like, yeah, well, RD, we could do a little of that too, you know, but we yeah. want to make this but we got to change pretty. something about that because, like, otherwise, like, it's so hard. Like, there's a there's a, an investor in our industry who uh, was part of the uh, team that, like, founded Guidant and then, like, um, I can't remember where, what else, but Jay Watkins, but he said, he, he said, like, at this uh, conference at, at LSI Emerging Vets Summit, amazing conference. I'll, I'll tell you about you should You should definitely go to it. But he goes, like, yeah, he's like, being a med tech investor, he's like, it's really, really, really hard, but like, I love it. But I'm like, man, like we got to do something about that. Cause most, most investors look at med tech and they're like, I don't see that huge hockey stick, you know, thing, but like, it takes money to take these companies to, to market, you know? It's really tricky. And, and one question is, will tech do it? Right. And, and I know Apple and some of these other companies really want to be in tech. And if you look at Dexcom, you're like, wow, that feels a lot more like a company, like a Google <laughs> or something like that. than it feels necessarily like what we think of when we think of med tech, which is stents and ICDs and stuff like that. And I think there's this convergence, right? Where like, you know, you're seeing, you know, Apple kind of very, very interested in, in healthcare. They have a big health division. What they're going to do with it exactly, nobody knows. But, you know, can we get, you know, stuff like Massimo and companies like that to be sexier? Massimo is very interesting. Yeah. yeah but, I mean, the- but again, like, I'll tell you, and I, have, I want a question for you, like, on the pharma side with Amazon and stuff. But, like, with Massimo, is, what's fascinating is that they their CEO, he's worth a billion dollars now, and they're doing really well. They made all these interesting investments. I didn't learn, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but I'll, I'll admit it. I didn't learn about these things until I was in the airport walking by a stand. I saw, like, a, I think a Forbes article, and it's like, like, MedTech's new billion dollar man. I'm like, what? And I started reading about Massimo, and I'm like, why the hell don't I know about this? This is, this is actually prior to me starting the show. And this is this is part of the reasons why I started the show. I'm like, why don't we know about these things? Like this, this should be like shouted from the rooftops. These are amazing stories. Absolutely. But but so like Amazon, Amazon had like all these tech companies had like big glorious failures in healthcare because I think they came into healthcare with their tech mindset. They're like, oh, we could, we'd be just really innovative and people will just adopt. It's just not how it works. I admire the fact that Amazon like had its failure and said, okay, we need to sort of acquire a way in. They got one medical, which is a fascinating business model, right? But I'm wondering your thoughts on like Amazon entering entering the pharmaceutical world, and if you could sort of parlay that with your thoughts on like Mark Cuban's uh, pharmaceutical venture, because like okay, I, I like Mark Cuban, but and, and I and I do like I think his statement one time was like, you know, I want I want my kids to one day say like, oh yeah, our our dad was the guy who like stuck it to pharma. Cool. But then we got to talk about reality. So like, can you, yeah. can you kind of like <laughs> share some yeah. color commentary on those things? Yeah, I do. I mean, you know, there's pharmacy and then there's pharmaceuticals, right? And, and none of these companies are doing pharmaceuticals. They're, they're trying to be 
in the distribution world. And the problem with the distribution world is the margins are really, really low. I mean, Cardinal Health and and uh, McKesson and those guys, margins are a couple percent. There's nothing to squeeze out there. The PBMs have low margins. The, the insurers don't have that great of a margin. So like, where are you going to go get this magic money that CVS and Walgreens isn't already like competing for? It's 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 like as if these companies were- And, having- the, vo- and the volume, that that's that's the thing. The volume. Yeah. It's it's really yeah. hard business to crack. And now Amazon's really good at low margin businesses and they have the wherewithal where they're like, look, they've lost like I think there's a report in Business Insider, which blew my mind, that they lose something like five to ten billion a year on Alexa. And so like what? Yeah, they just they're just like, whatever, it's okay. We we need to be in people's homes. And they're reconsidering that investment. It, isn't it, it kind of like Google? I feel like like so like Google like Verily with all due respect they're great right. at raising money. I feel like if you're an engineer or product person, great place to work. But like the sales and marketing people there, I'm like, what the hell have you commercialized? So they I feel like Google is like, out. yeah, it's like oh this this thing we put like fifty million dollars didn't really go anywhere. Whatever, let's just print out some more ad ad money from like YouTube and Google search and we'll be good. Right, you know? and 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 you know God bless them for for being able to do it. And, you know Mark Cuban can't do that. You know Mark Cuban, uh, you know is is kind of notorious in VC for pu- pulling the plug relatively early. So so a distribution business is like the last thing I'd want to be in because there isn't any innovation there. You know, uh, and it's it's just a hard place to be. There's if you know the the cutthroat world of generics, and I, I had a little generics company for a while. It is really tricky. It is really hard to make money, even as a as as a manufacturer actually making this stuff. But then when you sell it to somebody to buy at a pharmacy, and then they have to resell it, you know, it's just such a really, really thin margin that that unless he got actually got into generics itself, you know, I don't see how buying he has the scale or anything to to buy generics at a cheaper price. So for so for example, he's been touting that he he sells generic Gleevec for like a quarter of the price or a tenth of the price or something. It's like, well, what's your magic source of Gleevec that nobody else has access to because you're not making it yourself. You're buying That's it. That's what I'm thing. wondering. There I was is hoping you, it, you can tell. Okay. I was hoping you can tell me something, Matt, because I'm, I'm thinking, I'm like, he does not have the volume as like a CVS, a Walgreens, and everything. So how is he getting this drug and offering it at a much cheaper price? And I was thinking, I was like, maybe the margins are so big that he's just like, we don't need to take that much margin. But you're tell- what you're saying is like, there's barely any margin to begin with. Yeah, I mean, there are no margins uh, for these kinds of medicines. And I think that, you know, for, for pharmacy is just, it's a low, low margin business. I mean, you are literally buying from McKesson and you're selling it back to the patient uh, or the insurance, uh, or you're getting paid by insurance. And it's, he, he sort of has this like no insurance layer, like cash pay market, which again, there are certain situations where Walgreens will ask you to pay 15 bucks for something and maybe you get it for five bucks at Mark's place. But it's 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 there's no massive like pool of margin here to go after. Uh, and I think that without taking insurance, especially you're looking at like this kind of a sorry state. So I don't I don't know how much wherewithal he has to go there, but I think he's lying to himself if he thinks he's doing anything impactful. What would be impactful? I don't want to just rain on his parade because he did actually cite me as his reason for wanting to get into the space. And what's ironic oh, is really? like, was that yeah, in a good, in a good way or a bad way? In a bad way. And, and oh, again, Mark's sorry, been, no, that's fine. I don't care. <laughs> I, I, I don't take Mark too seriously. Uh, I think that, uh, <laughs> I think that um, he, in a lot of ways, like he could actually do something if he had a generics company, right? If you have a generics company and you're willing to say, look, I don't need to make money. Where you're producing and manufacturing yeah. yourself. Yeah, you, you have filed the ANDA. You go to the FDA, you do the blood uh, blood work, the blood tests to show that your product's equivalent to somebody else's, and you're willing to, to basically give the product away. There is a lot of, there are a lot of ways you can help people because ultimately what happens in generics, as you know, Omar, is if, if there's a drug from Pfizer and it's say $500 a pill, and you're the first to file FTF on that drug, well, you're not gonna come out with it at 10 bucks. You know, in fact, what most people do, because generics is such a crappy, low margin business, you say, hey, my product's uh, $485. And everyone says, what's the deal? You know, you finally make a copy of this thing and it's 5% off, 10% off. And the generic says, listen, it's it's something off. Would you rather pay 500 or 480? And, and the, the, the powers that be will pay 480. It only starts to tumble when a third player, a fourth player, and a fifth player come in, and then the drug will collapse basically in price to 30 bucks or 10 bucks. And the problem with Cuban is he's buying the drugs at 10 bucks and still trying to like make them cheaper. By then they're already cheap. The, the, the whole point is that you want that price to collapse as faster as, as if you're trying to be humanitarian. Now, the, the generic companies 
keep that price, especially when there's is a sole supplier, when there's one generic, they keep that price mm -hmm. relatively high because most of the other stuff in generics has almost no margin. So every now and then you get to be that first to file, you get six months of exclusivity. It's a regulatory thing. If you if you were a six to month six months on something like Gleevec, that's a juicy profit that you love. Now one can argue, should that be a three month exclusivity? Would that would the world benefit from that? Well, there'd be less incentive to make a generic, but maybe that's the right thing to do. Maybe that six months is just too juicy for some people. Now, if it's Gleevec, it's very juicy. But what if it's Daraprim? It's not so juicy. Three months is is kind of would be a very skinny product uh, profit. So I think that like there's a lot of issues in this generic world that could be potentially addressed, especially with somebody with deep pockets. But Cuban is also not a philanthropist. I mean, I think he's trying to make money. I think he's picked the wrong industry to make it in. Uh, they're, they're, they're the one company that, that did relatively well in this world was PillPack. Uh, PillPack actually did something different, and Amazon bought them for a billion dollars, and they, they uh, actually provided a service. Whereas I think Cuban stuff is, is still kind of like, I'm not sure where the money or the profit's going to come from there. Yeah, it's and th and thanks for kind of like explaining that because I was looking at it, I was like I, I was like I know one guy can ask, <laughs> but only, yeah, it just didn't make sense. The only thing this company does, and he calls it a drug company, which makes no sense because it's a pharmacy. Yeah, that's the other thing. Yeah, it's it's exactly. Company. I was like, <laughs> that's what I thought. Cool. I was like, I was like, maybe they're making something. I, it was something I never looked looked deep enough into. So I was like, maybe they're making some generics he or something. Did, maybe that's why. But. I think it's classic Cuban. I mean, he likes to talk and. And he doesn't produce, right? And I think the whole world would benefit from the opposite, right? Where it's, you know, if once you actually, you know, because uh, I, I broke down all of his stuff in a Substack post where, you know, I, I looked at all Your of the Your Substack is very good, by the way. I, I, I like it. I just, I just I checked I it out and subscribed to it. Thanks. I wish I had more time to, to write, but it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a full-time job of uh, trying to come out with these, these intelligent, semi-intelligent uh, beings, if you will, that, that can uh, help the world, I think. Yeah, because, no, seriously. And, yeah. you know, just... Like, you know, uh, are, are you familiar with Jeff Moore? He wrote the book, uh, Crossing the Chasm. I haven't read that one I'm, yet. You know what? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, after the show, I'm going to get your address. I'm going to send, send that to you. You're going to, you'll thank me. So it's, it's a great book on high tech marketing, but more specifically like product adoption. If you have a, that bell curve, you know, there's, there's, um, you know, they have early adopters, so on and so forth and the psychology for them. And so the, the idea is that for a high tech product, it has to have like a beachhead to storm, kind of like Normandy. Right. And so I'm wondering, you know, I want to I want you to, to think about this both from the doctor side and the patient side. From the patient side, what is that beachhead for Dr. Gupta? It cannot be everything. There has to be something that's tip of the spear. What do you think that the average person would be going to Dr. Gupta for? Like if you had to guess or if you had to say, hey, team, we're going to really market Dr. Gupta for this so we can get more traffic to the site. What, what, what would it be? I think psychiatry. You know, I think um, psychiatry is a world where doctor doesn't have to examine you, as I said. The, the symptoms of psychiatry for so many people, they don't realize that they have depression. They say, gosh, I feel tired. You know, gosh, I feel like I, I you know, just don't want to do anything. And they don't realize that depression is a real disease and that it's, it's, a, it's something where a lot of, there's a lot of stigma of like, oh, you can just snap out of it. Or the worst question in the world to ask somebody who's depressed is what are you so depressed about? And the answer is, there's nothing I'm depressed about. It's a brain thing. It's, it's, it's no different from bumping your elbow or, or, or something like that. You know, my brain is doing this to me. I'm not, you know, sad because uh, somebody passed away. That's called grief. Depression is when I just lose the 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 joy of the things that I used to have joy for. And if if you can elicit that out of somebody more easily, if it gets to the point where you have to go to the doctor, that's one thing. But if you can have that anhedonia and you know you you explain that to a machine that says, you know, I think you might be depressed, and that you know the stigma of an SSRI. Where it's like, oh, is this thing going to make me some, some kind of mutant? It's like, no, this thing barely works, first of all. <laughs> and you know, it's really not going to change your life in some profound way. You're going to have a little bit of better mood and you might have a little bit of a side effect. But ultimately, like, it's, it's not this big, big delta. Um, and there's other ways to treat depression, be it exercise, which, you know, you talked about food uh, killing our country. I think um, – I know it's killing me, uh, and I think it's killing a lot of people. Is the sedentary lifestyle? You know, I I work in front of a computer all day long, and and uh, you know, I, I I can barely run up a flight of steps. You know, it's it's really kind of a terrible thing, uh, and and I think there's so many Americans like that with DoorDash and the things that make our. It's so yeah, yeah. you never have to leave no, your steps. And, and you know, I'll, I'll say something about you know, on the on the depression side because I think you know one of the the big epidemics that came out of COVID that people are not like paying attention to is like, you know, is mental health, right? And I think that, um, 
you know, the way that I, I, I like to try and triage mental health, like at least for myself. And like, for example, um, you know, like, uh, and again, because I've having to go into medical school and I, all the, all, the majority of the books you see behind me are like psychology books, you know, but you know, something that I, I think would be really interesting for Dr. Gupta is like, if somebody is like, they just feel off, they go to Dr. Gupta and they have a conversation with it. And Dr. Gupta might, might, you know, say like, yeah, you know, you, you might be experiencing seasonal depression or some level of, exi of anxiety. And then that prompts the person, you know, cause a lot of times people think like, oh, if it's, if it's mental, then I'm going to be on drugs. It's like, no, it's like, there, there's a path where you can go to see a therapist or a psychologist or psychotherapist, Absolutely. right? Which I've done all of those above without taking medication. And they were yeah. remarkable because those, these people, which I don't think they get enough credit and I don't think they should, they're paid enough, right? Give you a set of mental tools and frameworks to like, like, for example, if, uh, for people who are depressed, like just getting in the exercise of framing, uh, like your like think of like a type A personality person who feels like they're not achieving enough and they're constantly comparing themselves. So just learning how to accept, Hey, like you're on a different path or to wake up and do like a gratitude thing, right? Like little exercises like that, that seems simple, but most people don't do them, right? Are I, life changing. You know I, what I mean? I never, absolutely. I, I never, as a far, as a full fledged farmer, bro, I never appreciated uh, psychotherapy. And then I saw a paper in JAMA that showed, you know, head to head against fluoxetine that CBT or talk therapy has just the same level of responsiveness in depression head to head. And I never seen that's saw, amazing. As you know, like one of the problems with psychi uh, with psychotherapy is that there aren't really good controlled studies often. And, you know, it feels wishy washy from a science perspective, but that paper hit it home for me. I was like, okay, I really see now you have this, you know, this great, you know, uh, win and even combining them potentially is great. I think the the, the the thing that you're going to see soon, I think, from Dr. Gupta and probably some of our rivals, hopefully not our rivals, but certainly from our side, is Gupta is going to start asking you questions, <laughs> you know, not the other way around. So Interesting. instead of, you know, you going to Gupta with a problem, I, I'd prefer that, that he checks in with you and asks you, how are you feeling? Tell me about your day. What's going on in your life? And every dimension of your life, whether it's nutrition or diet or your mental health or your physical health, you should have somebody who cares about you. And I know that you know, if you have, uh, if you have the money of, of somebody who's like a billionaire or something, you can have a doctor for every specialty that, that cares about your health. You can't, not, the rest of us can't afford that. And ultimately to have somebody right. check in on us and saying, have you been feeling good, et cetera, et cetera. All right. I'll talk to you later. Everybody can use a little therapy. Everyone can use a checkup. And I think that the cost of doing that and the time prohibitiveness of it would, would eliminate, uh, the ability for any of us to do it. But with a machine, potentially we can get and surface some of these things sooner than later. For example, I mean, you think about all the tragedies that happen. I had a friend of, of, of mine uh, take their own life recently. You wish that. Um, my condolences. Thanks. Um, That's not, yeah, it's not, it's happened to me as well. It's, it's, it's really, it's really sobering when you hear about those things. Two of my best yeah. chemists uh, took their lives while I was in prison. And it was one of the most distressing things because I, 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 thought maybe I'd be like a rock for them or something. And it, it was really horrific. One of them actually wrote uh, to my judge during COVID. He was, he's one of the brilliant chemists. He was, he was partially behind one of Vertex's great medicines. And um, he actually helped write to my judge to say, you should let Martin out to make an antiviral because he and I know how to do this stuff. We can, we can make this stuff. And, you know, the point is that, you know, if you could surface some of these things sooner than later uh, and get help sooner than later, you just never know. Of course, you know, uh, health is never perfect. You know, healthcare is never perfect. And, and you, you know, every, every leak you plug, you know, sometimes can create, you know, or there will be a new leak. So we always search for that, you know, solution, but it's something that's very sobering. Like you said that, you know, there, there will always be health challenges. And that's again, why, you know, instead of longevity and things like that, I, I try to focus on like, we have real problems today other than the billionaire who wants to be 200 years old, we still have problems like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and Huntington's and, you know, on and on and on and on that we still need to fix before we worry about, okay, well, like, can I look like I'm 20 when I'm 90, which is a really hedonistic, selfish thing to do. And like, I've, you know, uh, can, can undergo any health procedure I want, but I'm okay looking older and older as I get older. Some people make fun of my hairline and it's like, look, if I'm going to go bald and I'm going to, you know, get, you know, all these other problems, it's going to happen. And okay. You know, it's not, I don't want to look like I'm 20 forever. It's, it's, it'd be weird, you know? And I think that 
uh, healthcare folks should focus on that. I, I really don't like all this investment that's going into longevity. I think some of it comes from a good place, but I think a lot of it comes from hedonism and, and kind of like unnecessary, you know, kind of like, you know, sort of science projects for billionaires that I think isn't so good. Yeah. So, so I'm not like anti anti longevity, but I, I never thought of it like that. And I think you have a good point about it. Um, I mean, if not, if not longevity, I mean, what, if you were going to make like investments in certain things, like, like if it's not pathological, right. And it's going to be health related, like not longevity, like, are you, like, are you okay with like some of the biohacking stuff? Like, do you, do you see a difference between like the stuff that's more biohacking versus like longevity? This, this, so I feel like this question is kind of like, like what is digital health? Like it's been 10 years and people still know how to define digital health. We're still figuring that out. But the problem I have Omar is like the, the, the first drug I discovered or, or created myself was for panathenic kinase associated neurodegeneration, a disease of maybe 5,000 people. And it's uniformly fatal. It's just a disaster. Children who have this profound dystonia that's, you know, basically irrecoverable. DBS actually sometimes helps a little bit. And it's a vitamin processing disorder that's eminently soluble. I mean, it's very sol soluble. I mean, any decent chemist can, can make the right drug here. Our company put the wrong drug in the clinic due to we wanted to get our investors excited. And there was always this plan that we'd back burner the lead drug and put the backup drug in phase one while we kind of delayed the new drug. It's kind of a, a, a weird little tactic some biotechs do. And I ended up splitting with my company and the company went forward with the old drug <laughs> and they never put the backup huh. in the clinic and the, the old drug didn't work. And we kind of knew that would happen, but the, the acrimony with my company resulted in that happening. But the point is like, you have diseases like that. You have Huntington's, you have Friedreich's ataxia. You've got, um, uh, you have terrible monogenetic autisms like fragile X syndrome. You have um, huge illnesses like Parkinson's that just sitting there waiting for treatment. And you have people, and again, I, I, I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way because you know I, I'm a libertarian, you do what you want. But I, I still look at those sick patients. I met three uh, boys with pecan, this, this mm. lethal illness. And it's like, where should the incremental marginal dollar go? Should it go to the, the kids with pecan or should it go to biohacking? And I feel again, like biohacking is cool because it doesn't require any money, right? You just kind of do it yourself. And I think that's, that's oh, great. Yeah. But like when it comes to like, okay, we're trying to research, you know, longevity, someone's got to do it. But I think a lot of that stuff is kind of rubbish science anyway. And I think like we can think about, you know, the, the, the main sort of therapies that, you know, people think that like well, Pfizer's hard at work on this and Merck's hard at work at this. They're not, <laughs> they're just not. And then they think, okay, the universities are hard at work at this. Well, the universities can't put drugs into the clinic. You know, they're, they're waiting on the Pfizer's and Merck's to pay for that. And there's this big gulf in between. So like, you'd be much better off just, you know, kind of investing in, in startups and making that a more fertile place. Uh, Parkinson's is, is a huge illness. You know, Alzheimer's is much bigger. And these are still illnesses that affect millions of people that have no treatment, no treatment in sight. You know, it, uh, schizophrenia is another horrible illness. Still not a lot of good therapies there. Depression, tre treatment resistant depression. Uh, so I think psychiatry is still missing a lot. I think oncology is kind of getting uh, slowly sort of, you know, there's so much investment in oncology that it's, it's sort of making its way. But like musculoskeletal diseases, pain, you know, there's a number of, of, of spaces that just, don't have anything going on. And I feel like, uh, you know, the, to, to worry about longevity is like such a privileged, I hate to use that word, but like, it's like almost like a privileged perspective where it's like, well, wouldn't it be nice to live to be 80 years old when you have a death sentence of a disease at Huntington's or, you know, something like that. These, there's still many childhood diseases that are, that are lethal in the genetic world. Uh, fragile X is, is a monogenetic autism that that's nobody it, understands yeah. what's happening there. And it's, it's a really, profound illness where the mental retardation is, I mean, it's, it's literally called FMRP fragile X mental retardation protein. Um, and it's a protein that's very poorly researched, very poorly understood, but it probably interestingly, Omar, it, it, it probably also holds a lot of the secret keys of autism in general, because it's a monogenetic mm. autism that gives rise to a phenotype that's very similar to non genetic autism. So if you solve FMRP and, and fragile X, could you also solve some of the puzzles of Alzheimer's, which, as you know, has increased a huge amount over the last you know, uh, several decades? So I think there's still profound medical challenges. Now, I do think we're nearing the end of pharma to the point where, like, 
longevity is something to be worried about, where it'd be almost silly to talk about 30, 40 years ago, we've cured cholesterol, we've cured hypertension, we've cured all these things where it's like, what's left, you know, for, for the average person that's lucky enough to have a decent genetic profile, you know, you're really only looking at Alzheimer's and cancer, which seem to be kind of on their way out with especially cancer, you know, what's left is, is just us living the best health span and lifespan. So I, I don't knock people working on it. I just think that there's, there's other fish to fry. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree. And I think, I mean, I don't know, med tech and pharma, I think it's always had like a marketing problem, like both in terms of like talent and then these and the investment, you know, and, and sometimes like I would, I really wish, you know, you see some of these, um, celebrities, athletes and everything, you know, that they make money and they decide, Hey, I'm going to start like investing. It's always in garbage, like just things that to look cool. And I'm, I'm kind of waiting for like, I'm like, who, who's going to be the person who's like, Hey, you know, I'm going to invest like perfect example. One of my favorite like success stories, at least from the investor side, um, 50 cent, 50 cent makes a bunch of money. Right. And when you make a bunch of money as a rapper, the next thing is like, you go start like a liquor brand, right? 50 cent goes into a gas station, notices that like, there's a bottle of water that costs $1. And there's a bottle of water that costs like $5. He's like, why is that? Does some research and says, you know what? I want to get into the water business. And his friends, everybody's like, dude, what's wrong with it? You're a rapper. You need to get a liquor company. Like you're, you lost your mind. Goes and invests in some small company. Gets like, I don't know, like, like five or 10% of it, right? Promotes it at everything. One day that company gets bought by Coke. That company is vitamin water and 50 cent makes like $200 million. I'm, I'm, those stories do exist in med tech and pharma. And, and I kind of want to see some celebrities and some well-known people say, I'm, I'm going to back up these companies with, for social, social good. And like, if they don't have enough money, there's all these family offices that like are in construction. If they want to get into med tech, they're like, Hey, I'm going to get recruit some of these family offices that have like generational wealth and they can bankroll these companies until they're commercial. You know, I, I kind of hope to see that. A lot, a lot of family offices have been the, the, great saviors of pharma and medtech. And I think that that's a wonderful thing, but you're right about celebrities. Halle, Halle Berry is backing a drug company. I think as we speak, really it's kind of like, yeah, it's, it's not full fledged pharma, but I think it, it's, you know, that's sort of their goal. So I thought that was really cool. I noticed that recently. And I think that pharma is kind of like one of these inscrutable fields where to be an investor in pharma, it certainly feels like you have to, you know, know your stuff in pharma and, and it's, yeah. it's like, how do you define, sorry, just out of curiosity, like there's this other blurred line where I can't come up with a good definition. Uh, I, I, how do you, how do you distinguish a pharma company from a biotech company? Yeah. I mean, so to me, they're, they're one and the same and I just call them biopharma. Um, but in the yeah. old days, it would be a company that was using genetic engineering. Um, and what's funny is like some of the companies, um, that we would call biotech are really pharma and some of the companies that we call pharma are really biotech. So t these days, I think that, you know, you're still a biotech company if you're making a protein or an antibody, but a lot of pharma companies do that now too. In fact, most of the pharma bestsellers are biologics. So I think that distinction and that, you know, has kind of disappeared. I mean, I'm still really excited about like things like gene therapy and uh, which has sort of been slower than, than I might've imagined. And then CRISPR, which is really exciting. There's this company Intelia that I just love that, is, is creating CRISPR for liver diseases, which is like a really good place. Oh, it's huge. Play. Yeah. That's yeah, a big hard. one. There's a, there's a cool, there's a really cool robotics company that's uh, going into like liver biopsy called quantum, uh, quant, quant, quantum medical, but it's, it's called quantum, but essentially the guys who they, they started my rival company. So I started off in robotics at Mazor Robotics, which was the first robotic spine company. So these guys were at MedTech Rosa and then they essentially took uh, a lot of those learnings and went and started like a liver biopsy company. Oh, which is interesting. Do you know there's a there's a pharma company? It's not a pharma company. Let me stop there. It's a company called I think All Stripes, where essentially they find ways to get patients to enroll, share their data for these rare diseases, and they they're able to like sell that data to pharma to develop like rare disease drugs. I thought, do, do you know much about the company? I'm wondering what your thoughts are. I, I I looked at them a little bit, and I looked at all the other companies around the space where you know potentially there's a way to take all this data and do something with it. I think that. It's certainly a good idea. The businesses are hard to actually pull off. Like there was a company called Science 37 that privately was worth a billion dollars. They did a SPAC and now they're worth like $50 million or something. And it's oh, like, yeah. it's really- but That SPAC boom was, uh, what a ride. <laughs> it's, 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 it turned out, it's, I think it's really hard to do some of this healthcare IT stuff. Um, and like for Gupta, I think like in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's a product that we felt- was was oh sorry finish your yeah sorry finish your thoughts sorry it's something that i like you know whether it makes a fortune or not is is maybe less relevant i think that you know 
The idea that, you know, a lot of physicians work could be done by a machine is something that just the world needs to know that. And, you know, it's one of these really inconvenient truths, a little bit like the, the pharma skeletons where it was like, well, what are the things people don't know about this industry, healthcare in general, that they need to know? That's one of them. Um, you know, whether or not, you know, again, some things like, like generic drugs and Mark Cuban and, and pharmacy margins, like there's so much about this industry that needs to be demystified. And I just know my field and you're doing your part in your field, but it's like, you know, it, it, these are complicated industries and I don't pretend to know how yeah. semiconductor manufacturing works or things like that, but <laughs> pharma is one of these things where like, it, it's, it's really detailed, you know, it, it's, it's not that obvious. Uh, and I think that in the case of healthcare, you know, the fact that the a good chunk of the physician job is it can be automated. You went to med school, you know that you look at some of these therapeutic um, sort of paradigms, they're really just flow charts. <laughs> and, you know, yeah, and some of these yeah, illnesses, totally. like, yes, you, you do need the doctor's judgment and wisdom. It's very important. But sometimes if your patient presents with a, you know, 140 over, over 100, it's pretty much, you know, a lookup flow chart for that. And, and uh, again, I hate to trivialize it because I respect the hell no, out of physicians. But, but you're, but you're, you're right. And by the way, just, just for, 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 for context, I, I, I ended up dropping out. I was halfway through medical school. So I got the M I didn't get the MD, but no, I mean, you are, you are correct. And I think like on one side, you know, so I think out of context, you know, it's like, oh, you know, Shkreli and Dr. Gupta want to put physicians out of business. I think the big thing for you here is just that, you know, there's a lot of things that physicians are doing that you don't need to be paying, you know, have somebody that highly pay to be doing these kind of things. Right. And I think with Dr. Gupta, right, it allows patients to get their answers, questions or their questions answered, right. Without, you know, putting too much burden on the healthcare system. Right. And at the same time, I think it allows physicians to focus more on things that they would probably be better off using their time for, right? So I, so and it goes back to like something that I, I can't remember you, you had mentioned, but I remember checking an interview and you had said that between like a math theorem with your name on it and like making millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, like you want the math theorem with your name on it. So do you feel like Dr. Gupta is kind of like your opportunity to sort of like make Martin Shkreli's like positive impact on the world and like make things better, like in a, in a, in a, in a very, um, uh, in a very big way, you know, like, it seems like, I, like you're, 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 you're betting the farm on this in a way. No, I mean, I, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I think that it's, it's a really important thing for me to do. I think it's going to help a lot of people innovating in this space and trying to take all the world's information and, and make it a little bit more easy to traverse that information. I think it's a small thing that I can do. I hope that you know, if it, if it helps one person, which I think it already has helped a couple, you know, we've gotten a lot of people to, 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 to use it. I think that's helpful. You know, how much more work to do in this space is a, is a question that, you know, we just have to think about. I think that, you know, this is a product I'm always going to keep around for, for people to use, but, you know, can it go further and, and in what direction is something that, again, I, I have to think through because there's a lot of things to do with this technology. You know, could there be other professional areas um, other than medicine to advance? Do you want to go deeper into healthcare and, and get it to the point where Dr. Gupta is like this really amazing tool with 55 different features? Or do I want to maybe try, um, you know, making an automated financial analyst or an automated lawyer or an automated entertainment system? Uh, you know, these, this technology of AI has got a lot of applications. I think that, you know, Gupta is a, a good start. It did not take us a long time to make the product. A lot of the credit goes to OpenAI and and their amazing team. Uh, so you know we're thinking about you know do we add a therapist? Do we add other health information? Do we make it so that Gupta talks to you? Do we add voice and video? Do we we even we're going to put out an ad for who wants to be the face of Dr. Gupta? And um, I'll be actually, <laughs> yeah, you can have a procedural uh, system actually generate the audio and video. So there's a lot of things we could do with it, but it's a question of like where's the investment you know best done? Is it mostly there it has to make money. I mean, cause like, that's, that's how you make the thing better I mean, I, and help more people. Okay. Right. You know, I'm okay with, with like, you know, I mean, they're, they're, you know, I'm pretty much okay with, with it not making a fortune. I mean, I think ultimately, um, you know, some of the nice things about technology is that oftentimes these things don't cost a huge amount. GPT is this technology where the price is dropping rapidly. There's a lot of competition coming for it. Um, so, you know, Google has their own thing and we're now like a preferred vendor, their preferred vendor to us, or we're a preferred customer. And now we're looking at, oh, maybe we should use Google instead of open AI. And, you know, the prices of these, these things have gone down and, oh, by the way, you can ask chat GPT right now about, about healthcare. It's not as good as Gupta, but it does do a lot of what we do. 
So I think that like technology is coming for medicine one way or the other. And like digital health yeah. is something that's gotten a lot of things wrong. There's been a big overinvestment in the space. Uh, but I also think that if there's one way to like break the back of like lobbies and things like that, um, that are preventing, you know, kind of healthcare costs from dropping, I don't think it's pharma's fault, as you know. Uh, I think that maybe tech is going to be the, the place to do that. And, and this, the, the, the fact that information should be like uniformly accessible and available to everyone is something I really believe in. I think Gupta does that, but I also think like, you know, it, it, is, is the juice worth the squeeze to keep going more and more deeper on Gupta or is it kind of ready the way it is and, and, and like mm -hmm. good enough, we are going to probably add like APIs for like different med medical devices. So if you have a medical device that has an API, Gupta will talk to it. We're going to let you scan medical records. We're going to let you do all kinds of stuff like that. But do you see any point, potential collaborations with, with MedTech? Like, yeah, we've looked at, like if, you, uh, if you had to, if I told you that tomorrow you, you ink some kind of partnership collaboration with a med tech company, who would it be and why? Yeah. I mean, I think like Dexcom is, is like, you know, the, the, the big one, but you know, Apple Fitbit, you know, a bunch of these companies that aren't traditional med tech, they do sort of, um, allow you to connect. Uh, LabCorp is probably the one where LabCorp and, D and Quest. Oh yeah. Are, like, cause I have, I have a quest, I have a quest, uh, profile. And I was actually thinking about this. Uh, I was uh, funny. You say that I was thinking about this today. I'm like, man, it'd be really cool if I can just connect my quest diagnostic profile. Cause it has all my, all my labs in there to Dr. Gupta. Cause it, I'd be really interested to see like what it thinks about certain things versus like what yeah. I randomly do is eat, aside from my doctor, I'll be with my buddies who are now in, you know, in practice and we'll like look at my labs randomly with text back and forth, which I just feel like it's not a good use of my time. Yeah, absolutely. You like, is this, a, is this a good level for neutrophils? I don't, <laughs> you know, it's a very like yeah. tricky thing to ask and like you know sometimes you need the whole holistic thing so like you know in quest does a great job right but it's it's you know if you don't have every little facet it, it sometimes you can't connect the dots so i think quest and lab corp like the future might be more phlebotomy based and doing your own analysis and mm. you know i think that would cut a lot of costs out but um you know we'll, we'll sort of see i mean I, I i'm excited about the future for for gupta um but i also think that like the LLM technology itself like goes very, very far in trying to make it more convenient, more useful. I think we're going to do a mm -hmm. lot of that, but I also think that, you know, there's, there's already kind of this, you know, really big revolution. I think one of the big tricks is getting people to, to want to talk to a machine and really understand that, that it's got yeah. that efficacy. So I might do like a doctor challenge or something, doctor versus machine, <laughs> you know, kind of see if, uh, we can't, you know, evangelize the idea. Yeah. And just, yeah. just, uh, you know, Real quick, and again, I I appreciate you spending you know so much time with us. You know, are you are you okay on your time? Are you okay for like a little bit more, and we'll let sure. you go. Perfect. We 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 appreciate. It. I know my audience appreciates it because aside aside from the physicians who listen to investors, we have a lot of like med tech reps who spend like two three hours in the car driving. So I know they're just loving this right now. Uh, you pro probably based on the, the way I know my audience, like they're probably gonna be like, dude, when are you gonna have them back? Um, but you mentioned the patient side for your beachhead on the physician side. Since on the patient side, you say like it, the main use case or the beachhead you want to focus on is like mental health for the physicians who would come and like, let's say use Gupta, would it, would that also be like psychiatrist therapist or do you have a different, different, uh, uh, user in mind? So, so I think we may put out a, a institutional product because I think that in a hospital or in a practice, there's probably a lot an LLM can do and a system around that LLM where we're very good at making these like automated LLM systems that can really pour through a huge amount of data um, and then come up with recommendations. So like there are other people doing this, um, not exactly with LLMs, but there's other companies, some are really impressive that are working on practice management software and hospital mm -hmm. software that, you know, can use AI to determine, okay, which patients, you know, actually in a lot of trouble and you don't realize it because all the data is in the EHR. So, to me, I really like the consumer world. Nobody wants to be in it. Um, you know, the, the fact Why that we do don't that have, our, well, I mean, the business B2B pays a lot, you know, consumers don't like to pay the, that's the main reason I think. And but healthcare. Consumer, Again, I, I think the way you put it earlier was, was perfect, which is like, we use a different part of our brain for, for healthcare. I, I think that's, it's a very good way to put it. You know? I, I learned that one from Warren Buffett. Um, but the, uh, he likes oh, to yeah, he. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Finish. Yeah. He likes to invest in what kind of companies in, in brands where the consumer is using a different part of their brain. Um, 
to, to make their purchase decisions. So like when you buy Coca-Cola, you're not sitting there thinking, oh, it's 15 cents of sugar and water. You're sitting there thinking, I want a Coke. You know, it's like not a rational decision at all. The same thing with bleach or something. You're like, I want Tide. You, know, you don't think that, you know, this is really, really cheap chemical that I could probably buy for 10 cents on the dollar. Um, so, I, you know, one of my friends worked for him and uh, told me that story about the different part of your brain thing. I think that for consumer stuff, um, I'd, I'd like there to be a world where people pay more attention on the consumer healthcare side, but it's, it's one of these things where every software entrepreneur is, is wants to focus on the business side. And it's too bad because, you know, people are, are the, the place to begin, I think. And ultimately by the time somebody gets to a doctor, you know, and, and gets into the healthcare system, uh, the whole point is that we want to break that system a little bit, that it's this monstrosity $4 trillion system in the U S that is just this big cost gob that doesn't make sense. And if we can cut out the system completely, forget wanting to be a part of this. I don't, I'd rather have a new system. <laughs> and I think that, you know, connecting right to the patient is something that, that I think is great. Why don't we have our own EHR data? Why does that live in Cerner and Epic? Like, why can't it live with That's me? A great point. Maybe on a blockchain, maybe independently, maybe on my own USB, like, my doctor doesn't know so, anything so about that when I, Yeah, ex no, it's it's just such a great point, and I, I, I don't, yeah, I, I don't know why this does. It's so obvious because every any time like I change healthcare systems or insurance companies, it's like I have to go through this whole thing again. And there's things I forget about, like my family is, and I'm a, look, I'm a young guy, I'm I'm educated, I'm in good health, and everything. So think about your average person who's not educated or someone who's older. I think they're gonna remember all these things, you know. I think that's what so, Apple. I mean, one of these bigger tech companies, whether it's Apple, Google, or Meta. I think they're going to figure it out and realize that if we manage your identity, your social identity, and you you are willing to put all this embarrassing stuff in there, maybe we can manage your health profile too. Do you think uh, you kind of just uh, made me realize? Do you think that this is the? Uh, I, got, I mean, pro there's we all we all consume our own ver version of propaganda we like, right? But like, do you feel like this is the propaganda that Apple? Maybe that's the long long play that Apple's doing with this whole because they're they're pushing hard on like they're spending billions of dollars on ads to promote like hey. You can have privacy. Like there, there had one Apple ad where you're in the they're in the doctor's office, and it's like all these people, all this embarrassing stuff. It's like, oh, I knew you had this, and it's like, oh, put it with Apple, safe and private. And I was like, why did they spend all that money for that? Because nobody's going to buy an iPhone for that. They're doing mental health now too. I mean, they're trying to that the recent developer conference. Uh, Tim Cook re revealed a couple of mental health things where they're going to ask really? you questions like, are you feeling good? Are you you know is everything okay? And maybe potentially even through the patterns we use in our phones, we can they can sort of you know, maybe glean something from your health. Oh, they have a hundred percent, especially with social, with social media. I mean, think about it like this. If you had access to somebody's like three apps, Spotify, yeah. Instagram, and let's just say, I don't know, Twitter, or just, just between Spotify and Instagram, you can absolutely, I think, diagnose or get an idea of like what's going on with somebody's mental health that day. With all that big 100%. data. You know, especially with like big data where they can like get positive controls and say, okay, these people were diagnosed literally with depression. Let's work backwards, look at the iPhone data and see if we can get signal to noise. Oh, it's, that would be fascinating. You know, but especially they, if you like, I was gonna say with a, with an, I don't know if an LLM would do this, but like, just if you were to get all this data on somebody's life, like within a year and map, you know, sort of match it to see like the, the audio books, the podcasts, the music, the things they're interacting with, the things they bought and everything, that would be I mean, AI is just a, AI is just a really fancy word for statistics. You know, it's it's just yeah. like applied statistics. And you know, as I as I learn more about AI, the same way when I started in biopharma, I had to learn everything about biopharma, and it was really painful. But I enjoyed it, um, reading papers all day and all night. It's what I've been doing with AI. And as I peel back every layer and look at every equation and everything like that, at the end of the day, AI is 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 you know a lot of like regressions and and you know sort mm -hmm. of clustering of data that that gives you answers. Obviously transformers and LLMs have their own thing, but they're still a math equation. And ultimately, you know, with all that data, I think, you know, tech can, can really transform healthcare, but you know, there's also a feeding frenzy over the last several uh, years, there've been this massive, massive investment in digital health. And we've seen companies like the digital um, therapeutics yeah. companies go bankrupt and, you know, suffer uh, trying Man. to make you know, those companies. <laughs> pair, successful. Pair, pair, I'm sure you were watching, but like pair therapeutics. So uh, this may not be public screw it. I'm just going to mention it. Um, I don't think, okay. So pair, uh, you know, so pair therapeutics for, I don't, I don't want to explain too much about it, but all, all people need to know is that they went public and they were valued at like three or $4 billion, 18 months later, they're bankrupt and they're selling their assets. Right. So I heard from a few people 
at the auction that they had, right? They sold all their assets. It's like four multi-billion dollar, all their assets for $6 million. Okay. The um, asset they had, which was their like mental, mental health uh, uh, product, which had already gone through the FDA approved and everything was purchased for only $2 million by who? The two former, the two founders. Wow. And I was like, so in a way, these guys built a company. They got this, they got all the money, got this through and everything. Now it's gone and they just bought their ready to go product and they own a hundred percent of it. They'll, they'll break even if they just do a hundred, 500 K a year after a few years. And I'm like, I don't think anybody would have thought like, Hey, you know what we should do? Raise a bunch of money, get this done, but then r like run the company into the ground and buy back this asset. But sure as hell looks like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure they like, I don't know. Yeah. It's just hard to it's hard to get insurance to pay for some of the stuff that doesn't fit in the box that you expect it to. Yeah. You know? That's where like, you know And by the way, just just to absolve myself, this is allegedly like I could be completely wrong about what I just said. I heard it like from a third person, but it would make a hell of a story. But like I, who knows? You know, probably not the real story. Probably not true at all. Yeah. Completely absolved. <laughs> you know, but like I yeah, I, I don't know. It's what um so just kind of kind of wrapping wrapping it up again, again, I appreciate you spending so much time with us. We're going to do some rapid fire questions. We'll be done. You know, it's it's late over there in New York, but we appreciate you spending time with us. So you okay for a few rapid sure. fire questions? Yeah. Okay. So number one, uh, what was the best piece of advice that you were given that hurt you? Like it hurt you personally, but it made you change for the better. Oh, man. How much time do we have? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I'm think good on my time, man. My, my, my wife's my, – my wife – is, is a, she knows I'm having a good time with you. She's got the baby. So like yeah. I'm, I'm on your time. So I want to be respectful oh, no, of your time. But yeah, being facetious, like I've gotten so much, but the, um, gee, the, that, you know, the conditional there that, that hurts you is difficult because, you know, uh, uh hurts you, upset you and just intuitively what, what think, came to mind? Something think, came to I mind think, first. I think maybe, well, I've gotten advice that's, that's, uh, the advice that, that sort of hurt me is I had a couple of friends that said, you know, Martin, you know, this is the early days of, of Retrofin. And they said, Martin, you know, when you pitch the company, you know, you tend to be, you know, it's hard necessarily to believe everything you say. And I, I took, I took that with a grain, I took it a bit with a grain of salt, but I started to internalize it. And I started to change kind of the way I pitch companies. And the advice that I would give back to, to other people is that one of the most effective pitches you can give for a company is not when you say that everything's rosy and everything's perfect. That actually arouses kind of suspicion, <laughs> you know. That, that arouses like, wait, what? What are they hiding? And I used to think that that's the best. way. you want to, we're the greatest company of all time. It's going to be great, et cetera, et cetera. That's actually not that effective. Um, what's more effective is when you kind of lead with the issue, and then you explain why the issue is either going to be a non-issue or it's manageable or whatever. And as I changed my pitch, we went from struggling to raise a couple million dollars to raising hundreds of millions of dollars because you'd say, okay, well, you know, I know you think that, you know, the big issue here is that, you know, can we get an extended patent life or something like that? And you'd explain that, you know, this is how we're going to do it. Most companies don't do that. Most companies say, well, our patent life expires in 2033. And then the investor kind of digs back and says, well, actually patent life expires in 2025. You hope to get it to 2023, 2033, but, but you're not telling me that up front. And I don't like that. Whereas, you know, I learned over time, you say, listen, our main patent expires in 2025. We think that's a very high chance we're going to get the patent of 2033, but it's not a guarantee. I'd be lying if I told you it was a guarantee. But I, 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 the old approach I would take was, oh, yeah, we're, we're good until 2020, 2033, you know, and that's, you know, that's just not the way you do things. And over time, I've learned to be kind of like bring the, the bring your dirty laundry out as soon as you can in the pitch. And it, it generates this trust. Uh that's like, wow, this person came in and told me the, the three things that are going to go wrong with their company and why we shouldn't be worried about. They did the work for me because that's my job as an investor is to go find the three things that keep the person up at night. And by leading with them, you sort of um, develop this trust and you help the investor realize that like you're going to be in this together and worried about the same things. And that the upside is everyone knows who the upside is. You know, it's just what's the downside? What's the risk? So that's kind of one thing that that helped me a lot. Um after people were like, observe my pitches and, and say, you know, you're, you're not being, you know, forthright enough. And I, I think that helped me a lot. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. Couple, couple more. What's, what's a book you feel like you gift or recommend most often? It could be anything. There is a, if there's more than one book, feel free to, feel free to share that. Yeah, there's a bunch. Um, 
there's there's this book um it's a it's it's an odd little book but i i like it it's called the art of learning by josh waitskin josh was a uh, oh the the chess player yeah yes yeah Yeah. it's a great book why why i wasn't expecting that why why do you like that book so much well um josh was the subject of the movie um searching for bobby fisher and he was a chess prodigy and um the problem with being a chess prodigy or being a prodigy at anything is that it's it's really really difficult i think emotionally and for your for your sort of growth and i think what josh did was he mastered chess obviously became a chess champion and then he became a tai chi champion so he did something totally different and he became really great at it and i think what josh's point is that while we tend to think that we have like a gift for one thing probably that gift is can be lateralized into other things. Like if you're really good at X, you know, it may not be because you're like naturally good at X and then you can actually learn to become really good at something else. And that most people are really good at something and that they tend to th- put themselves in boxes that say, well, uh, you know, I'm really a, a pharma guy or I'm really a med tech person. I can't do that thing. And we, we tend to sort of like defeat ourselves before we start. And for, for Josh, he was able to like wipe the slate clean from his life of chess, which I actually played a little chess as a, as a kid and nothing like Josh, but you know, the tournament life of chess and the touring that you have to do, you go to different competitions around the world and it's really taxing. And he basically wiped the slate clean and said, I'm going to do that with Tai Chi. And he ends up being the champion in Tai Chi. And it's like, what are the odds? You know, it's a very physical sport. Uh, this, this part of Tai Chi is martial arts. It's, 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 it's a, like no different from karate. And uh, he ended up becoming a champion at that too. And I think part of the book is, you know, it's mostly biographical, but it's also, you know, the takeaway that you can get from it is that you, you can be good at anything. If, if you have the right approach and have the right, almost like faith uh, that you can do it, you know, um, at least Josh's story is like very inspirational. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a, that's an absolutely fantastic book. I, I love it. And the last question is, um, you know, now that, I mean, you're, you're a busy entrepreneur and everything, but, you know, you probably have some hobbies. Like, what are some things that you like to do to sort of like relax and, and you know, just kind of take it easy? Uh, lately, uh that those words are alien to me, but, um, I know I, people ask me the same thing. And I'm like, my dad once told me when I was a kid, I asked my dad, I was like, you know, Baba, what the kids at school ask me, what's my dad's hobby. And he's like, son, you'll learn that for our people, our work is our hobby. So it's, it's the same thing with me, man. But yeah, yeah. like if, if you're not working, if you're not in front of a computer, what is Martin Shkreli doing? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. Uh, I, uh, one thing really? I think some people know about me is I, I just love animals. So like, and, and little kids, so <laughs> I like, wish, I wish my I wife can sit and play with my like, cat for like two hours. With and, like, I love like uh, going to the yeah, zoo. Why, why do you love animals so much? I think there's this like, and it applies to like children as well. Like if there's a big party, dinner party or something, and there's like a kid section or something like that, I go hang out with the kids and I like play hockey with them with like, or play pillow fight or something. Like I just, you know, there's, there's life is so serious as an adult and you're just so fixated on, on, on like, you know, getting my revenue up or raising more money or whatever. In my case, dealing with the law half the time because I get in trouble for breathing, uh, you know, taking a break and saying like this, in the case of my cat, you know, this creature that has not care in the world, <laughs> you scratch her chin and that's the happiest part of her life. And it's just like such a, an amazing thing. And children, again, you know, say the darndest things, but like, you know, for, for your, your son or for anybody else, it's like the best thing that can, can happen is an ice cream cone. <laughs> it's like, what a joy to, to sort of see that that still exists in the world. And it kind of like gives you that sense that, you know, no matter what that court case is, or no matter what that, you know, what your revenue number is for next quarter, like there's still a world where, where there's that innocence and that pure love and pure joy that, you know, can, can help keep you grounded. So for me, like, you know, things like that, whether it's an animal or, or a a friend who just had a a, a baby, you know, there's something really beautiful about that, that, you know, we of course lose it as we get older, but you know, uh, it's important to keep that perspective that like, you know, life's serious, but it's also not that serious. There's important things, you know, that, that are beyond, you know, business and beyond, you know, uh, you know, just the, the rat race. Thank you for enjoying another epic episode of The State of MedTech. If you're feeling inspired and love this episode, do us a favor, hit that subscribe button and turn notifications on so you never miss an episode. And be sure to give us five stars and write a short review because that helps more people discover this amazing community of ours. If you're a company who has a executive that you'd like to be on the show or perhaps you want to sponsor one of the episodes, shoot us an email at hello at Take care and we'll see you next time.